I'm going to start the record button. All right. So this is a public hearing, as you know. Um, and I'm not sh uh, so. Yeah, it is open to the public. And that person, if tell us, if we can talk to them in the, in the waiting room to see who they are. They can be part of this meeting, but we don't know who they are at this point. So we wanted to check that out first. Um, but uh, there's Crystal. Here's another board member coming on. Um, I'm going to introduce the board members real quick, uh, and then I'll give you a chance to to introduce yourself, and then we'll give you ten minutes for a Q and A with the board. All right. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So let me set my, let me get my timer. Let me introduce the two board members that are here right now. Um, so I'll start on my left. Martha, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Martha Wilson. Um, I am one of the newest folks to get onboarded. So this is my first cycle of um, application reviews. Great, thank you. Crystal. Hi, good evening. My name is Crystal Prieto. I'm a first time year board member with the Housing and Human Services. It's a pleasure meeting you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, and you know me, uh, Eliberto. Um, our director would love to have been here tonight, but she had a family uh, a family emergency that she needed to take care of. So she, she's not going to be here tonight. Um, and okay. you can't see her, but Brenda Palacio is in the background. She is our wizard that does the scheduling and all of that. I'll give Great. you a second to introduce yourself, and then I'll start the timer for questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Eliberto. My name is Jude Sky. I'm the Director of Development and Communications at the Center for People with Disabilities. So my job is fundraising and also different types of communications, market, marketing, education, information, and that type of thing. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, I'm not always the expert in programs and finances, but I have a pretty good sense of what we have going on here. So thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, so I will, I'm going to start the timer and we don't have to use the 10 minutes, but you know, uh, we have them. Uh, so board, if you want to start with questions. Does the board have any questions for? Go ahead, Crystal. I always try to let others answer first because I talk too much. <laughs> um, so my question for you is: um, so we, you're obviously requesting funding from the city of Longmont. What is what exactly are your plans for that funding? Is it to go back into your programs, uh, funding staff? Yeah, that's great. Great question. <clears throat> I believe in the proposal in our budget, we show where we're going to spend that. And it's basically to support, most of it is to support independent living advisors in the Longmont office. And they're the first gate point of entry. So anybody with a disability who needs any assistance living independently, they meet with an independent living advisor. That person helps them assess what their independent living needs are. And if they want to become a consumer, then we come up with an independent living plan. And then we could either support them in our programs and services, but we're also deeply collaborated in the community. So if they need other programs and services, we connect them and make sure that we stay with them on that independent living plan. So the funding that will be used will be to support those services by supporting salaries. Yeah. Perfect. And can you talk a little bit about some of the collaboration efforts that you have going on with other agencies in the, the county or community uh, to help the participants that you serve? Yeah, um, if I could have two seconds to open something up here, it would help me because I am not the, um, the, the program person. So every time we do this, I always ask them for who are we collaborating with. So um, uh, okay, so yeah. We collaborate, hmm, I can't find it in the proposal, but we collaborate with, well, first of all, let me get back to, to the screen so I can see you because I feel like I'm staring at a computer. We've been around since 1977, so 46 years. So we're, we know everybody in the community, we've seen people come and go. We collaborate with housing authorities, we collaborate with El Comité, we collaborate with our center, we collaborate with Safe House Progressive Alliance, we collaborate with 
like the the different city municipalities at times we've collaborated with other like youth groups and other things like that whatever we need in the community because we get together and try to share resources and figure out who needs what who can help with what um, sometimes those collaborations take the form of working together on something like during COVID, we created this equitable vaccine clinic for people who are with disabilities and people with, in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, we also um, collaborate with different communities to help with different uh, language barriers for monolingual Spanish speakers or people who speak ASL. You know, And so we're always working together to try to make sure that we're increasing access to services and access to independent living services. And then on the other side of that is cross referral. So if let's say, you know, we're not giving out housing vouchers or doing anything like that, but we can walk people through the whole process, stay by their side, help them with the applications, help them manage their appointments, collaborate with the housing authorities, and then collaborate with people who can get them in, a, in housing and so forth. So that's the nature of it. You know? And we've been around so long that we all know each other. So we're working together as, as good as possible. Yeah. Yes, your organization has been around for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I have an older sister who okay. has um, deafness and a developmental delay. So I kind of tell people that that was my first person I advocated for since I'm okay. um, younger. But um, I, I noticed... Um, it wasn't in the application um, and I wondered about um, the representation on any of your board members who have diverse abilities. So I saw that the race breakdown is there um, and it looked like seven of eight are white, but I was curious about if any of that representation was in abilities. Yeah, I think something like 70% of our board are persons with disabilities. So we have people on the board who are amputees, people on the board. Uh, I don't know, our president, I don't want to say this wrong, but it might be cerebral palsy or some other form of a significant mobility disability. You know, she really can't move very well or talk very well. Uh, we have people on the board who are blind. We have people on the board who have other disabilities like PTSD. Um, I'm trying to go through my through the list in my head here. Um, but we we strive to try to um, primarily like um, represent diversity among people with disabilities on the board. And also we're trying to represent diversity among geographic location. We want to have people who also live in Longmont, not just everybody in Boulder. And also we try to um, recruit people um, to represent ethnic diversity as well. We also have somebody on the board who's autistic and um, non-binary slash trans, somebody on the board who is Spanish speaking only or dual Spanish speaker, somebody on the board who is part of the LGBTQ plus community. So we've got eight board members. Um, you know, we're doing our best to try to make sure that we have as as best of representation of our community as possible. Um, and I, you guys are board members, or right? So you know how how in demand you are, and <laughs> we would love to have you on our board. Do you want to be our ninth board member? <laughs> Watch out! You might have to fight Ali Berthel for that one. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> he worked hard to recruit us. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Martha, did you have any other questions for him? Because I had one more. Yeah, I got one too. I was just curious about, um, you know, what was there, but not on the application. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Crystal, because I have a question after you. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to know, can you talk to us a little bit about the types of programs you have? You don't have to go into, uh, you know, kind of like deep, uh, details about it but talk to us about the programs and and how they really um and and how they were structured to really serve the population um that your organization serves okay i'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible in the interest of time but we'll, let me start here by saying that 
historically people with disabilities were significantly discriminated against, marginalized, institutionalized. In the 1980s, the Supreme Court of Colorado passed a law that if a doctor deemed that somebody was mentally retarded, they could be into, put in a forced eugenics program, forced sterilization for population control, et cetera, et cetera, right? Going back into the 60s, we had the civil rights movement, the independent living movement alongside, and that stimulated the independent living movement. So we're a center for independent living, which means that we are mandated as designated as such to provide five core services, which are information referral, independent living skills training, peer support, nursing home and youth transitions, and individual and systems advocacy. So all of our programs are based upon that. Those are best practices that have originated over like 70 years of work with people with disabilities. It's not prescriptive. It's not case management. We don't tell people what to do. It's based on consumer control, consumer choice, seeking independence. In addition to providing those service, those core services, we provide additional programming for unique populations. Like we have a beyond vision population for people who have lost their, vi their vision or are blind. We have a veterans independence program. We have an employment program We have youth programs. There's a whole list. But those core services are woven in. The tenets of what we do is about championing people to live independently. And so we do whatever it takes to help them. That's what I was talking about, the independent living advisors. What they're, when they come in, if somebody's like, I need help filling out a social security application, they're not going to say, let me do that for you and let's send it in. They'll say, let's take it step by step so you can learn what's going on. In that process, they cultivate the courage, the resilience, the strength. They learn more. They get independent. We teach them advocacy. You know, if they have a mobility disability, we might teach them training. If they have a visual disability, we teach them assistive technology, whatever it takes, because we serve all people with all disabilities. What we want them to do is to have the freedom and the choice to live independently where they want, to choose their doctors, to choose how people treat them, and to promote inclusivity in our society. Um, I guess I'll pause there because I was like, Try to 25 paragraphs in four sentences, you know? That's great. No, thank you so much for answering okay. that question. I appreciate yeah. it. You bet. <laughs> All right. So our time is up. So I won't ask my question. I might email you, dude, afterwards. Um, because I want to give you your time. Um, and you, again, you don't have to use it all. Uh, but you have five minutes to share anything you want to share with the board. And I'm starting it now. Okay. I'm going to try to take two minutes and then bounce back to you so I can answer your question. What I just shared is really important. I mean, we're a center for independent living is a very unique organization and how it serves people, consumer controlled, consumer choice. It's run by people with disabilities. It's a critical piece of independent living in the community. There are, you know, there's nine of us in the state of Colorado. We each have our region. So when we don't get support in a particular area, it really impacts services. More people wind up homeless, more people wind up in the emergency room, more people you know, wind up struggling to get benefits and take care of themselves. So I just wanna stress how important what we do is and also just say thank you for supporting us all these years. We've been a long amount a long time. We're purchasing the building we've been in that we've been renting. So we're here to stay and we're here to do good work in the community. I'll stop with that. And then if you wanna ask me your question, Ellie Berto. Sure, I'd sure you, uh, you know, as you know, the board and staff look at different things, right? And I, I primarily focus um, on more of your agency level kind of stuff, uh, your strategic goals, uh, your, your budget. And the one thing I noticed is you all do really well with a couple of areas. Um, your, your, your federal money, a lot of it, I'm assuming, comes from program revenue through Medicaid, uh, some of that work, and government grants you do well, and you do decently with your foundation work. And I guess the question I had was, what is the the plan or the work? Because where the one place I did notice that you that I that wasn't as strong was your individual contribution and donation uh, bucket. And just wanted to ask if there's thoughts on that or work on going on on that. Yeah, it's a great question. So yeah, we do have money coming from the federal government as a center for independent living, and we also have money from the state as a center under Title Seven Seven. We get money for part B, part C. Um, and then we have fee for service programs. All our services are no cost to consumer. It's Medicaid reimbursement. Right. But we're doing well with certain programs, which provides us with unrestricted funding so that we can support our overhead and that type of thing. So 
and, and my position, so I'm doing like a few jobs at the same time, you know, communications, marketing, fundraising, grant writing, all that kind of stuff. And in my experience, the return on investment for the amount of energy put is limited in individual funding. I mean, we're not, ba we're not like the Wild Foundation or Save the Rivers where we count on all these individual donors to make this happen. We have a pretty stable, predictable okay. stream. So we don't necessarily need to diversify into individuals to protect our revenue. But what we do is we use that more to steward relationships. You know, we get 25, 100, $200 donations. We use that to steward relationships and the little bit of money helps. And it also helps us more or less make connections and share about who we are. But it's not something where we're worried if we don't have this huge swath. And if I dedicate the same amount of it, it almost takes the same amount of energy, for example, to like do this meeting and write this grant as to steward a $50 donation. Uh, there's not enough of me to go around to make that happen. So okay. th that's kind of what's going on there. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Thank you. Do I have any more seconds or are we done? Yeah, you got about a minute and a half if you want anything else to say. Um, when you're looking, because you look at our finances, I also want you to know that we use accrual accounting methods as mandated. We have a third party audit that does an independent audit every year. So sometimes it looks like we have a big net income at the end of the year, but that's because we have to book revenue in the fiscal year that we got it. So if the Longmont Community Foundation gave us a grant on September 30th for $100,000 that we were going to spend at the end of this year and into next year, we would book it in last year right. and this year. So it just, it's a little bit confusing. And if you ever have any questions about how much money we actually have, give me a well, call. But I, think you also, I think you also have a cash flow piece on your audit. And I think the cash flow piece sometimes can be a little more, more, um, what's the word? It can demonstrate more the, the, the realities of the, of the, if yeah. you do, I think you do have a cash flow piece. Yeah, we do. In your audit. So, yeah. all right. Um, well, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank I really you. appreciate all the work that you all do. And, thank um, you. and yeah, have a good rest of your night. Okay, good luck with the rest of the interviews. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. And our next group is in the lobby. It's a big group. Um, so we'll go ahead and let Intercambio in. Let them get set up. All right, I hope you can all hear us. Wow, you guys brought out the whole team. <laughs> um, I think you outnumber us, actually. <laughs> so um, welcome. Um, I'm gonna do some quick housekeeping. Um, so, this is a public hearing, uh, and so it is being recorded and will be on our City of Longmont YouTube page. Um, you will have 10 minutes for Q&A from the board and then um, and then uh, five minutes for you to share whatever you, you feel you need to share. Um, I'm going to introduce the board real quick uh, and our and staff, and then we will jump straight into questions, and I'm going to set up the timer. Uh, so let me start with introductions. Why don't you go first, Crystal, this time? Hello, good evening. My name is Crystal Prieto. I am a first time board member with the City of Longmont Housing and Human Services. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Martha? Hi there, Martha Wilson. Um, I'm also a first time um, board reviewer and this is my first year serving. I think you all know me, I'm Aliberto. Uh, who you don't see on the screen is Brenda Palacio. She is our wizard in the background that handles a lot of the scheduling and these meetings and things like that. So I'll let you and I ask that you do it as quickly as possible. So we make sure because we're always running a little late, uh, introduce yourselves and then I'll start the timer. Great. I'll start. Uh, John Lopez, CEO of Intercambio. Hi, good evening. Uh, Donald DeAngelis, Director of Development with Intercambio. Norma Fuentes, director of the Boulder County Program. And Erica Carlson, manager of grants and evaluation. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the 10 minute timer and we can start with questions from the board or if I, as, as well as staff.
Um, I can start. Um, I thought your application was very impressive. Um, I think I was most moved by the fact that you have a fairly diverse board with a third of you having the lived experience of um, immigration. Um, I, I was curious about which languages um, are able to be taught, uh, just because I know we have populations of um, like refugees that are local. Um, and I was just curious about what the languages were. I think you're muted. Yeah, I was gonna actually pass it off to Norma. Norma handles um, the local programs and though we can all answer the question, uh, it's just most appropriate to let her take center stage. Okay. Well, we have around uh, like 70 different languages, it's something even 20, but right now we have Cantonese, Catalan, Chinese, Dairi, Haiti, Japanese. You know, it's very, very diverse, Mandarin, Nepali, Persian, Vietnamese, Quechu, uh, Spanish, obviously, the majority of our students are from, uh, uh, you know, from Latin America. But I is 17, we have like 17 languages in 37 different countries, a student for 37 different countries. And so any language can learn English in our classes because they're all taught in English. Mm -hmm. um, we do use translations when we have to for getting people doing intake, a lot of Google Translate, either on the computer or on the, mm -hmm. we have some materials, but we can't cover every language we serve. And so it's a lot of you know, talking with the hands and translating different words. And I sit, my office sits next to a level one classroom. So I listen to them all the time, teaching amazing things to people who maybe don't speak any English at all, so. And, and Martha, I think that was your question. And, and uh, some context there is our curriculum is designed so that the volunteer teacher need not speak the language of the learners with whom they're working. Uh, go ahead, Crystal. Uh, what sets your program apart from other organizations in the county that basically do the same thing? Well, uh, many different stuff. If you don't mind, I can ask a little bit. Uh, I think this is number one, our curriculum, that we, our curriculum is designed for um, life skills, English life skills, you know, and we also have the teacher uh, book that is different. And uh, this is one of many different things that we can say. We really focus on the integration, the importance of the integration of the immigrant community and the connection that we make with them and with the way that we connect them with the resources that we have in the community. And Crystal, I might add, um, as, as we interact with other types of organizations and learn about them, one of the things that separates us, I believe, is the, the totality of what we can do, meaning uh, there are a lot of programs out there that actually teach ESOL, and then there are publishers, um, and there are different types of organizations that do different pieces of what we provide in totality. So the whole combination of in-person, group classes, one-on-one, -on -one, online, being a publisher of materials for organizations across the country, as well as running successful programs. Now, what we found is a lot of publishers don't do both. They publish, but they don't necessarily run the programs. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes us unique is we do all of those things. Yeah, and Crystal, also, I would like to piggyback. I think you know, keeping in mind that we're really cognizant and recognize that English brings opportunities for these recent immigrants. So that, you know, our focus is to increase economic stability. So, you know, Engl through English, they're able, folks are able to um, Im improve job chances and improve economic um, stability for themselves and their families. So I think that's a really important aspect of Intercambio as well. Mm -hmm. Do you find um, that there's a lot of barriers into receiving funding, especially given that a lot of the participants that probably seek your services are not documented and, you know, there's all the government red tape. I mean, we don't, we don't currently have, we have government funding like, like you, but we don't have um, federal funding for several reasons. One of them is that usually you're required to use a curriculum that is not our, 
personal curriculum that we've developed over 20 years of doing the work. You have to use something that meets certain standards that we have found are not the standards of what, you know, what is needed in the community from all the work we've been doing. Um, I think also to jump on your other, you know, question, you know, thousands of people, even in Longmont, according to the Census Bureau, you know, need help with English. And so there's room for all of us to do different work in different ways. And I think, you know, if a program is teaching and getting federal funds and they've got 500 students, great, we'll have another, you know, four or 500 students. There's so many opportunities and different people need different things too. So, yeah. Go ahead, Ali Bertho. And if there's time for more questions, we'll jump in. Uh, yeah, no, there, there is more time. I, I mean, so again, I think for those that have been doing this for a while, Erica uh, and Norma, you've been in these meetings, you know that board and staff look at different things. Uh, and at one, I want to applaud you because you do pretty well with, you know, between your program income and, you know, selling and your fundraising income is pretty impressive uh, for your size of budget. Uh, you do a good job of having that three-legged stool of funding. Uh, but I, and, and I also look at your, your program budget and I found, um, I just wanted to ask about the child care piece. Are you providing child care now? Uh, I can answer. Uh, this is the first time that we start providing child care. I don't know if you have been aware about the, the policy that has been, you know, approved by the state that children under, you know, three years and older, they are have the free child care. And we haven't had, uh, you know, a lot of need. You know, we have had very few moms that needed the child care. And that's why we are stop offering the child care right now because what has been happening, not having seen the needs. Uh, however, is we have moms that they cannot come to the group classes because they need a child care. We are putting on the program those one on one when the teacher go to teach them to the day home. They we are still serving those mom and they are one of our priorities. You know, but don't let be hand, but I'm not offering the child care anymore at, at our facility. So you're not offering it a, anymore. That's a change no. since we submitted the budget. So if you no. need a new budget, it's a very small. Yeah, we'll probably, okay. So that's fine. You you can send me something. Okay, good. Thank you. I just want wanted to check that. Thank you, Erica. Mm -hmm. Martha, did you have any more questions? No, um, my questions were answered between you and Alberto. Awesome. Well, then I'll I'll keep talking like I know how. <laughs> um, so you talked a little bit about um, kind of the results that you see after you serve families and help them in their, you know, their journey to learning English and what kind of opportunities that opens up. So do you conduct any post surveys for the populations that you serve? And, and what are you finding? What do you... Um, is it long-term surveys? Is it kind of just immediately after graduating the program? What are you folks hearing? Erika? Are you playing roulette here? Okay, who's who's the winner? Um, so we do a lot of surveying and checking with our students in addition to Norma and her team being super connected. Like sometimes I'll say, oh, how about this? Oh, I just talked to somebody and they got a new job. I mean, that kind of anecdotal continual just understanding of what people are going through is um, super critical to our program. But, um, you know, we do a survey every two books that people take with us. So a book is roughly like a 10 to 12 week term of classes. So kind of every six months. Of course, people come and go in classes, so it's not perfect, but that's the kind of concept they would get to a year. And then we have done, um, and we're a little overdue for this again, but kind of a deeper dive um, a couple times now where we have done interviews in person or on Zoom with um, our students to get it, some of those deeper outcomes. And that's where we learn more about, you know, earning the earnings, because it doesn't isn't something that happens in a 10 week or 20 week period, those kinds of changes. Um, but we do ask people about their um, you know, how are you communicating in your child's school, you know, and how are you communicating at the doctor? And we used to just ask, like, are you doing it in English? And we, through working with our staff, we found that really there were so many ways that people communicated that it was important to know whether they were able to communicate in their language, or maybe they have a teacher who speaks Spanish, or maybe they're bringing their child to translate. There's so many different permutations, and it's, it's, a slow process, but we see those gradually changing where it starts with maybe no English at all, maybe, oh, now I can speak in Spanish with my teacher, I feel more comfortable, or I'm, now I'm able to speak in, in my language. So the things we look at are about your job, 
about how you're communicating with your child's teacher and with healthcare professionals, whether you're moving along that spectrum to being able to have your own communication um, in English with those with those people. Um, and then also, uh, <clears throat> what am I missing, Norma? Help me out here. <laughs> we ask them um, specifically about their goals. And then we're going to be, we just started doing a real detailed look at that where we say, well, okay, looking at kind of like your work environment, what are your specific goals? And then we're going to be following up with them to say, okay, well, you said you wanted a job. How's that going? Or you said you wanted a raise to try to get a raise. How is that going? And those will be you know, kind of more one to two years where we see those kind of things changing. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm very impressed by your organization. I think it really means a lot for someone to be able to transition into the country if they're new and be able to communicate and advocate for themselves, for their family. So thank you for the work that you do. It's really important. All right. And I'm going to stop us there because we went over about a minute. So I'll give you guys about, about three minutes to, to if you have anything to share, because we've gone over a little bit on the time. Okay. I just want to share an anecdotal story. Um, during our, our Cambio last, our annual fundraiser this earlier this year, we had a student who read about a four page speech, uh, did amazing, amazingly well. And then at the end of it, she shared that she was able to say her wedding vows in English on her own. Uh, and, and it's those kinds of moments that you, you start to really fully embrace and appreciate the outcomes of the work that we do. Uh, for me, being a relatively new CEO, um, those are really, really uplifting moments. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just, just can add something else, you know, uh, our student has been very fortunate and lucky, you know, by learning the language to have an, an employee. You know, uh, we have, we see few students that they are unemployment. And I think that's an, a huge impact, you know, and it's very enjoyable to see them not only having a job, but are getting a better job. Or, or, or get a better races. Uh, you know, we struggle sometimes with attendance. You know, they miss a class because they are working. And this is very enjoyable to see, to see, you know, the impact that learning the second language or English, it is so important for our community. I don't know if you know blue corn tacos, but that's my favorite anecdote because we were doing our 20 year book of pictures and we stumbled, I stumbled upon a story of a guy who was having trouble because he was working in a dry cleaner and he was getting sick. And it's a story we'd written 15 years earlier. And then I discovered it was the proprietor of blue corn tacos in Longmont. And I was like, oh, wow, we had kind of lost track of him. And then we saw, found him there running his business, which was what his goal was in that earlier. So we, it's, yes, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of entrepreneurs too. Yeah, a lot of entrepreneurship for sure. Yeah, I can talk all the night, but Alberto is not giving me time. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. We're just running late, and uh, uh, but I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. I think uh, we appreciate the work that you all do, um, and uh, appreciate your time, and and hope that you have a great rest of your night. Yeah, you too. Doesn't go support. on too long. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Bye. 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 Pleasure meeting you. All right, so the next group is here as well. We'll let them in. Um, why don't you let uh, go ahead and let uh, Mile High United Way in? I did let Lauren know that we were running a little late. Okay, so Lauren's Lauren's from. Um, uh, dental aid. Okay, right. Yes, we are running a little late. I apologize for that. It, it just we have really great conversations. So that happens. So uh, welcome, Rosemary and Carmen. I will. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of of, of house of, of of housekeeping real quick, uh, and then we will jump right in because again, we are running behind. It happens every year. Um, so first, uh, just to let you know that this is a public meeting and it is being recorded um, and will be available on the City of Longmont's YouTube page. Uh, I'm going to introduce our two board members that are here tonight, and then I will ask you to introduce yourselves as quickly as possible. And then I will start a 10 minute timer and hopefully you get five minutes. If, we, if our 10 minutes go long, I will take off the five. I will take time off the five minutes. But um, so I'll go ahead and introduce uh, and I'll start with with Martha first. Hi there, I'm Martha Wilson. This is my first year on the board. Thank you. Crystal? Hi, my name is Crystal Prieto. I'm a first year board member. Pleasure to meet you. 
and Carmen, we haven't met. My name is Eliberto Mendoza. I'm a project coordinator for um, housing and human services, or actually just human services, not housing. I don't do housing. Uh, and uh, you can't see her, but um, Brenda Palacio uh, is our executive admin, and she handles all of the scheduling and all that stuff. So why don't you quickly introduce yourselves, and then we'll jump right in. Okay. Um, my name is Carmen Martin, and I work with Rosemary. I am the Director of Program Strategy and Community Partnerships at Mile High United Way, and I'll pass it over to Rosemary. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us this evening. Um, my name is Rosemary Thompson, and I'm the Program um, Manager for the Personal Investment Enterprise Program at, Foot, at Mile High United Way. All right, great. All right, so let's start with questions from the board. I can start. <laughs> so um, I know you folks primarily through your hotline, I think that's what you call it, or your helpline, I should say. <laughs> um, and I was just wanting, for one, it's such a, it's such a needed resource because there's so many resources, right? Like I'm a firm believer of like, if we could just get people to the right resources, I don't think that there would be any need out there. I think people could meet the needs that they have. And so uh, I just want to commend you for the work that you do. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit about how that looks. So how does that process look for participants that you serve who might be calling in seeking resources? Is it kind of just, is it like a 30 minute long appointment? Do they screen them? If you could just kind of briefly go over how that program works. Rosemary, I'll start, and then if you want to dive in, feel free. Um, our two major needs at 211 are housing and, and food. And so we work with our partners for those referrals. We do have Spanish and we do have bilingual um, operators there that can address the needs, but we also have a TransPerfect line. So any language that comes in, we can address those concerns. I don't know about the wait time, but we do have real time data that helps to inform our community investment programs. Rosemary, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, yeah, so in terms of the personal investment enterprise program, if we know that there are needs within the program, we can certainly refer them to that 211 helpline. And um, as you may know, um, sometimes families or individuals in the PIE program um, have some challenges and they're not able to continue saving with the program or actually complete their um, what we call asset purchase with the program, such as their first home or business development or po post-secondary education or items that they need for those goals. So. Um, if they withdraw from the program and take their funds with them, then we usually include a note saying that they can reach out to 211 if they have any needs at this time. And for the PIPE program, are you guys collaborating with Workforce Boulder County or is that separate? Yes, that's right. So Workforce Boulder County does provide all of the financial education workshops. Um, they are also, you know, a uh, offering the CHAFA, the, Col the Colorado Housing Finance Authority um, home ownership classes. And those um, are back in person now. And so that's something that's available um, to everyone in the PIE program. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, go ahead, you go first, Martha, that's fine. Oh, I was just gonna flag that I, I need to recuse myself off of this one only because um, like two years ago, I was a, a PI program member. Um, but I will say I was one of the people who like couldn't get a loan just because I have five kids and um, we need a lot of house for that. Uh, but um, I just wanted to also provide uh, a little bit of context that like I still use those skills and I actually doubled my amount of savings when I left. So um, the strategies that they use do work. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we can talk about whether you need to recuse yourself with Christina. That's a good, cause yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. So we'll, we'll have further conversation on that. Um, I, I, it, but that leads me to a question because I think that that's an, what Martha just said is 
um, is 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 a reality, right? And I think Rosemary, you've talked about it. So I had a question around, you know, as we see, I guess my question is, Pi's wonderful program, um, as as uh, housing prices continue to rise in the area, you know, what's the relevance of Pi when it, you know, it it gets harder and harder to purchase a home, you know, and we just heard Martha's story. Uh, and what are the thoughts on that? Yes, definitely. Um, so some of you may remember that we um, were piloting a program where people could um, go ahead and have the opportunity to save $2,000 with a match of $8,000, right. which would provide $10,000 at the end of the program to augment what people would have available through PI. And so um, we did see, because we're just coming out of the pandemic, a, a, actually some additional um, challenges there in terms of purchase. But our advisory committee did say that they would um, saw that a, a, a minimum of $10,000 is really needed to purchase that affordable home. And so um, at this point, we do have um, sev several people that um, are on goal for that um, larger savings amount. Um, one person has reached their $2,000 mark. So, you know, they are still concerned about that high interest rate. And so we have consulted with some of our housing advisors on our committee. And um, there's an idea that they could actually use some of those funds to maybe buy down the interest rate, which would help them long term. So that would be one strategy. Of course, they're always able to expand um, that um, what they have available. So they could, in addition to PI, they could also apply for a grant um, or they could apply for other sources like pair it with uh, another affordable housing program so that they have more available to purchase that larger home. And so that's what we're doing right now. In this application, we have asked um, for you to consider another $8,000 um, opening in the program and also for $4,000 openings as well, just because we know we need to really balance the two because some people may not want to or have the capacity to save that $2,000. And so we really don't want to cut people out at the lower end if they're wanting to maintain, you know, pursuing, for example, education at that lower lower amount. Um, so those are some of the strategies we're employing right now. We've also worked with um, with Marsha, who leads the workforce um, classes, and she is going to, in, during COVID, she put together a special class just on the uh, additional resources, down payment um, for home ownership. And um, we're looking to put something together again like that, perhaps just for PI participants to make sure that they understand the other um, the other items that are the other programs that are available in the community so that they can pair. And I just wanted to add that we work closely with Habitat for Humanity. We work with a lot of the low income housing programs. So we don't work necessarily with private realtors, but with the other programs. So this money goes farther considering our partners. Okay. Do you folks serve all of Colorado as far as like the the United Way hotline or phone line? The phone line does serve all of Colorado, but the PI program um, is for the city and county of Boulder and Broomfield. Okay, and then my follow-up question to that is, how do you ensure that the resources that you're providing to folks is up-to-date and current? That is probably one of the biggest challenges and some pop up and some go away and some stay the same for a long time. Do you have like software that kind of picks that information up off the web or do you have, you know, uh, advocates that go out and, and collect and report back? Is this for a 211 or for PI? 211. 211. Do you want to take that, Rosemary? I know we have um, data quality um, people that help to assess that. Um, we do have like over 7,000 community resources. So it's definitely a big job to keep those current. I can imagine. 
Yeah. Yes. So we have some staff members, and that is their focus in 211 is to update those records um, and make sure that that's current. And I've done that myself for Pi to make sure that our information is in there and make sure that that's current. And um, because, uh, you know, my no my phone number has changed before. So making sure that people are, have a, an effective way to get in contact with us. Thank you. So I have 30 seconds left really quickly, Rosemary. I, I think one of the, one of the things that, that, that I know I, I really enjoy about Pi, I mean, yes, it's about asset building. It's about wealth building. Um, how are we doing with businesses in Longmont and Boulder County? I think that I've always I've always seen that that is a key component of asset building is helping people start their own business. Yes, we have um, Jesse Esparza, who you may know. He works with the Small Business Development Center. The Small Business Development Center is um, our partner for business because we're not experts in business development ourselves. Um, so we we try to make sure we're, we started as a partnership program and we maintain that. And so everyone who works with um, a business, ha when they apply, they put together a sheet that is um, focusing on on their business and that has to be approved by the small business development center so they um, are able to consult directly with with the small business development center to have that guidance um, and so we had um, this past year two businesses actually um, um, from um, residents in Longmont that were able to complete their time in the program and um, just really briefly we have um, one person that developed their photography business and they were able to purchase a digital camera an iPhone and a computer for their business with their Pi funds and so um, that is something that um, we can share with you as a as a success story um, in in business right now. Awesome, awesome. So we went over a little bit. So I'm going to give you about three minutes uh, for you to share anything you need to share. Carmen, would you like to start? Yes, I would. Um, I know that diversity, equity, and, and inclusion is very important, and. Uh, Rosemary and her partners at Community Action Programs, they really outreach to Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, because we know that there is systemic racism around generational wealth building. I feel like this is one of the most impactful programs that we have at Mile High United Way because it truly can change lives. And I'll let Rosemary speak. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time and inviting us back again. We're just so highly uh, appreciative of the support of the city of Longmont, and we want to continue serving um, the community there. We did have five people graduate um, from the city of Longmont this past year, three in home ownership and the two in business that I mentioned. And 32% of our participants in Boulder County are from Longmont. And so that's, um, you may know, is about 24 um, out of the 76 um, in Boulder County. And um, we are, as a, as a long-term, long, long range um, perspective, we've had 161 people graduate from the city of Longmont. So we're really proud of being able to offer this service in the community. And it's really thanks to um, funders like the city of Longmont that make it possible. So thank you so much. Well, thank you both for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, love the work that you do. And uh, you can go ahead uh, and have a great rest of your evening. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank nice you, Alberto. All right. Good seeing you all. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you. All right. So now we have, oh, where did Lauren go? I'm not sure she dropped off. I'd sent her an email letting her know we were running a little late, but this is her uh, the board president and is Jose also with them? Yes. Okay. Yeah, both oh, there she is. There she is. All right. Let me let them all in. Here we go. They're coming on. 
All right. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. I apologize for the tardiness. We just get into these great conversations with our agencies, and sometimes we go a little bit late. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so uh, as you you may, may or may not know, this is a public meeting, so it is being recorded and will be on our City of, of, of Longmont YouTube site. Um, what we're going to do tonight is going to give you going to give you ten minutes for Q and A. If we go over we, and five minutes for uh, a chance for you all to say what you have to say. If we go over a little bit on the Q and A, I'll take a minute or two off the five minutes, um, depending on how great the conversation goes. Um, I'm going to introduce our board members real quick, and then I will let you all. Uh, I'll let them start with the questions. Uh, so I'm going to start this time with Martha. Hi there, Martha Wilson. This is my first year on the board. Thank you. Crystal? Hi, my name is Crystal Prieto. This is my first year on the board. It's a pleasure meeting you folks. I am Amelie Berto Mendoza. I'm a project coordinator for Human Services. And you can't see her, but Brenda Palacio is the one who uh, organizes these meetings. Uh, I'll, if you can all introduce yourself as quickly as possible, I will start the timer and we can get going with questions uh, and then give you some time to share what you need to share. Lauren, you're on mute. Yeah, we can't hear you, Lauren. While okay. she's there, coming now, on. Can you hear there me? We go. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I'm Lauren. Uh, I'm the person who wrote this, this grant. <laughs> I'm the grants and outreach person for Dental Aid, and I've been with Dental Aid about two years now. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm Mark Howard. I'm the chair of the board of directors for Dental Aid. I've been in that position for about a, a year and nine months. Okay, thank you. My name is Jose Mena. Uh, I'm the dental director at Dental Aid. I've been with Dental Aid for about uh, 17 years. Thank you. All right, why don't I'm gonna start the timer? Why don't we start with uh, questions from the board? I can go. So, um. First and foremost, I just wanted to uh, say thank you folks for providing the services that you do in our community. It is so important. <laughs> and I wanted to just ask you a little bit about, um, you know, how you serve those populations, maybe who don't have insurance. What kind of interventions do you provide to those folks and in, in their time in need? Dr. Mena, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, so uh, our, our, our clinics, uh, you know, are, are here to, to help the underserved uh, populations. Um, we offer it. Uh, comprehensive care, um, and you know, uh, for patients that 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 uh, that have you know a vast number of needs, we offer emergency care for people that are in pain. Um, we have um, a hygienist, you know, that 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 uh, that we do regular uh, uh, cleanings on patients, um, and we recently uh, started doing uh, uh, outreach at at. Uh, a wellness center in, in Boulder. And then we also and, and have a Head Start outreach program with Boulder County, Boulder County Preschool. And uh, we're also getting our mental health partners outreach program back underway, uh, which is something that we've had in past years with mental health partners, but it was suspended during COVID and we we're trying to get that back off the ground. And Crystal, I just can't, I can't resist piling on, um, especially with a question like that. The, uh, first of all, I also wanna briefly introduce the handsome guy who joined at the late here with his glasses on. Um, that's uh, Ron Bergloff, who is our new executive director um, at Dental Aid. He is in his third week on the job. So while he is on and is, I'm happy to have him uh, come on, I'm, I, I kinda wanna give him a little bit of a pass on some of these questions. Um, sure. So, uh, so I'll I'll try and uh, uh, unless he wants to jump in, I'll uh, I'll try and add on a little bit. Um, from a board perspective, um, we we are as Dr. Mena said, we are all about serving the underserved and the uninsured, and um, and that we I think we live by that by really having 
globally, or not globally, across our three um, clinics, over 90% of our patients are either on Medicare, Medicaid, or uninsured. Um, the, the, you know, we can do that because we're a nonprofit. We can do that because, um, and, and very, you know, very few, um, dental practices can, can manage that. Uh, and, and nobody that I know of manages anybody close to that kind of, kind of a percentage. Um, and in Longmont, that, that comparable percentage just chips. And as I think Lauren sent out earlier this evening, just our chips and Medicaid, I think, uh, Medicaid, Lauren, yeah, Medicaid chip plus run. and uninsured combined is 88% uh, of our Longmont patients. So, so that's it. We really try and provide, you know, whatever they need for, den for dental wise. And so I'm assuming the funding that you folks request from like the different cities in the county um, goes into direct care for patients. Is, is that correct? Some of um, it? Some of it, absolutely. And the 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 money that is designated to for direct care for patients, we try to preserve for direct care for patients. Um, you know, there's a longer story there, but I'll let, I have a feeling you're going to get there. And last question, and then i'll I'll give the others a chance to pick your brain. Um, do you anticipate the new um, Medicaid uh, limits? uh no longer being there or them covering like 100 percent max of what they would typically cover do you anticipate that allowing more funding to be available to folks maybe who are not eligible for medicaid or who don't have insurance dr so, um yeah if i could answer so i i think that you know the the fact that the medicaid um has uh has lifted the the limits so tr previously the limit uh per patient was fifteen hundred dollars per year uh, for treatment. Um, so that will definitely help the patients uh, that that have Medicaid get more treatment done. Um, however, you know there's there there are there there's treatment that that Medicaid you know often doesn't cover. Um, take for example, you know say some say we have a patient uh, that's in pain uh, on a second molar. Um, if if that if that if that molar needs a root canal, uh, or, or if it needs a crown, or if it needs, you know, several things. Unfortunately, Medicaid doesn't cover those expenses. Um, additionally, um, I mean, I, I, I think I'm very grateful, you know, for the fact that that $1,500 limit has been has been has been removed, you know, for those patients. Um, the issue, one of the main, one of the big issues that we have, however, is the fact that um, we also see a lot of patients that they're not eligible for Medicaid. So uh, that's that's where you know the funding that we get from our partners is quite useful because of the fact that you know say we have a you know we have a you know we have a, a say a a twenty five year old patient you know that you know the head of a household you know, with with children um, works really hard uh, but unfortunately just makes you know barely enough you know to where they don't qualify for Medicaid but they don't have any kind of dental insurance. Um, Sometimes, you know, when, when a patient like that comes in with, you know, major needs, uh, it can put like a, it can put a family in a, in a bite, you know, because of the fact that, you know, especially if somebody's in pain, um, you know, sometimes they have nowhere else to go. And, and you know, we're, we're as part of the, you know, of our, of our mission is, is our goal is to, is to help people like that. Uh, so again, uh, that's, that's, that's where, Dr. you know, Dr. funding Matt, is critical. I have a so my understanding too is that the the issue with um with medicaid isn't so much the the cap on benefits it's the cap on the reimbursement rate i mean the the benefit the, that's the yeah. issue for dental aid so they can raise the the total benefits cap all they want we're still only getting reimbursed well below well yes, below I mean. what it costs us to actually provide the the care that's absolutely so true raising so, that that upper limit it that will help with um with uh patients who come in and have already and they're needing diagnostic care because legally we're, we're required to provide that but they may have exhausted those benefits at the dentist that just sent them to us <laughs> so yep. it will help with that 
but with the rates that we're actually getting, the, the payments we're actually getting from Medicaid per procedure, it doesn't affect that at all. Is that, am I interpreting um, no, that No, you're, you're right. Basically, yeah. it's, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we're glad, we're very happy that our patients um, have more, um, more, more funding available to them to have procedures, uh, you know, covered by Medicaid. However, the, 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 the you're right, the, the benefit, the, the reimbursement that dental aid receives from, from Medicaid does not increase or has not increased. Right. So for example, say if somebody, you know, say we have a, we have an elderly patient that needs dentures. Um, you know, of course, you know, we're grateful for the fact that, that Medicaid will you know, most often, most often will cover those dentures. Um, you know, the, the reimbursement to dental aid, you know, has not increased, you know, for those procedures. Yeah. One set of dentures is, can cost what, $4,000 or? Yeah. Which... Dental is expensive. So you guys, you folks do some wonderful yeah. work. So thank you so much for all you do. Yeah. So just quick, you. you know, just to follow up on that, you know, it, so if, if Medicaid's reimbursement for, a, you know, a, a set of dentures is, you know, say if it's, say if it's, you know, 450 or $500. Um, you, you know, if we think about all of it's involved in, in the chair time and the, the lab fees that are involved in making those dentures, it, it makes it really difficult for us to be able to uh, provide those services uh, for the, for patients who really need it uh, because of the fact that, you know, it's just it, the, the cost of, of providing that service is you know, is quite high. So our time is, is coming to an end. Um, I just had a quick question um, uh, around your 2024 budget. Um, when I took it, when I take a look at the budget, I, you, do, you all do really well with your program service fees, with some of your your your, your local government funding. Um, what and I'm, I guess it's more to Mark and Lauren, right? About um, fundraising and, and contributions. Is there is there thoughts or plans on how to how to increase that that particular line item? The short answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are uh, there are some private foundations that are really supportive of us um, when it comes to older adults, but I will say that they are getting the trend this year has been they're getting more and more and more applications. And so with one of the major ones, we were one. Well, there was they received eighteen. They received eighteen million dollars in in funding requests. They had six million to give away. <laughs> so, so if that gives you some idea, and we were one of the few that actually received uh, a grant. So, you know, it, we're we're doing well with the private foundations in terms of their support, but it's still not. It's just not enough. Right. I can't, right. Say, that, I can't uh, say that it's not enough. Enough, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, I can. So I can speak, yeah, I can speak to some of that. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, much of what my role is uh, was identified had to do with a lot of this uh, funding process, donor uh, uh, fundraising. We had uh, Laura and I have already talked about this. Um, what I've done, we we met with. Uh, the representatives from the government of Mexico. And so we've got, there's a lot out there. We're, we're going to work on our own infrastructure in terms of reaching out. So uh, next year, we'll, this going forward, 2024, is, I believe is going to, for, for fundraising and grants, uh, I think it's going to look very different from what it did in 2023. Good. Okay, great. Good to hear. All right, I'll give you all about three minutes um, for, to, to close up your night. Anything you all want to share? Um, I'll, I'll follow up. Let me let me say that uh, I've I've come from the uh, both the volunteer side, private side of practice. We're closely now with Dr. Meta for three weeks, Mark and Lauren, and um, I will tell you that we that I've spent time with our patients, um, special needs patients, patients that are compromised. We had a patient in this week that came from battered women's shelter. Um, these are there's there's a lot of stories that I wish that I could share. Um, Dr. Mehta saved a man's life last week with eight extractions. 
a homeless man that didn't have any insurance. And this, this, what we're doing is is very, very real. And uh, and uh, there are real people behind those dollars. And that's just what I wanted to say. And I and I will just conclude, if I may, because I I think that obviously Dr. Mena and Ron and Lauren can tell you specific stories that are um, heartrending. Um, but it's good to be a part of them. Um, I was on. I hate to admit this, but 35 years ago, I was the um, deputy city manager and the budget director for the city of Longmont. I sat on your in, in the in your exact spot um, and saw exactly the challenges that Lauren uh, outlined. That uh, we would have four times the request for funding um, for external agencies than we had available. Um, I think one year it was even five times. Um, and uh, so I appreciate what you all are going through and appreciate the thoughtfulness that it appears that you're going through um, to evaluate that. And we very much appreciate and value your support. All right. Well, I, we appreciate the work that you do uh, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, appreciate everything that you, you shared with us. Um, and we hope that you guys have a really great rest of your evening. You too. Thank you for your consideration. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. So when we made the schedule, we wanted to put in a break for you all. We're running a little behind, but I still want to give you all a break. Um, but instead of giving you 15 minutes, I will give you, let's, let's take uh, maybe 10 minutes and be back at 6.53. And um, uh, we will talk to Derek and let him know uh, What's that we're running a little behind. So you all can take a, a quick 10 minute break. Alberto? Yes. Quick question. All right. Well, good evening, Derek. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll jump into the interview. Um, so um, just so you know, this is a, a, a public meeting and it's being recorded. And um, we will uh, put, post it on the City of Longmont's YouTube page when it's ready. Um, I'm going to introduce the board, our, our two board members tonight, and then introduce staff, and then give you, you know, a, a, a quick second to introduce yourself, and then we're going to get started with 10 minutes of Q and A, and up to five minutes of giving you a chance to talk. If we go over on the Q and A, we'll that'll reduce your five minute talk, but your opportunity to share. But that's that's okay. Um, so I'm going to start first with Martha. Hi there, Martha Wilson. Um, this is my first year serving on the board and happy to hear from you guys. All right, Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal Prieto. I'm a resource navigator with EFRA and I also do some work with St. Frank Valley. This is my first year on the board as well. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I'm Alibert, I'm a project coordinator for human services and you don't see her, but Brenda is our executive uh, assistant and she's the one who manages all of these meetings and, and scheduling. So why don't you go ahead and, and introduce yourself and then we'll go ahead and start with questions. Well, let me first say thank you so much to all of you for having me. I can't imagine how mind numbing it is to introduce yourself every 15 minutes over and over again. So thank <laughs> you for thank you for being willing to do this. Um, uh, nonprofit speed dating with the likes of all of us. Um, my name is Derek Timmerman. I'm the Senior Development Director at A Precious Child. I work with community foundations, government organizations, faith-based communities, and uh, I work with grants as well. So this is a great opportunity to be with you um, and would love to say more about A Precious Child. All right, well, you're gonna get your chance as we ask questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the timer. Whoever wants to go first. If not, I have a question. All right, I'll go ahead and go first. And then we, um, so um, so Derek, I do have a question because, uh, so as board and staff look at different things on the application that you provide, I look at your program budget and your, and your, and your agency budget. And when I was looking at your program budget, I noticed that you didn't tell us how you're gonna use the 20,000 so I think you, you you might have submitted the wrong form. And so, and that's fine, that happens. Uh, I can send you the template and you can send it up. But while while I have you, let me ask. So it sounds like the program you're seeking money for is your, uh, res what's it called? Empowerment Resource Center, correct? 
Empowerment Resource Center. Yes, that's correct. Right. And so um, is the fund you are seeking, for, are the funds you are seeking for to staff for case managers or to purchase stuff for your program there? Both. What What is the what is the primary use of this money? It's probably two thirds, one third. Two thirds would go to the actual supplies, the home goods, food. The programs, the program supplies? Supplies, that's right. And a third would be for the staff to oversee the expansion to serve okay. long runs. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Good to know. I just, I just wanted to make sure that it was something that we do fund and we do fund program supplies. That is something we would we will cover. So okay. That was my my question. For sure. Can Thank you, you talk a little bit more about the program that you're wanting uh, the funding for? What, what do you folks do in that program? Absolutely. Yeah. So the mission of A Precious Child is to uh, empower children in need to achieve their full potential with opportunities and resources. And we do that through our four um, cradle to career initiatives. And we have eight programs that tuck up under those cradle to career initiatives. The biggest of those at A Precious Child is called our Empowerment resource center. It's where families can come in re referred from our agency partners um, and receive uh, the opportunity to go in the resource center to have a cost free shopping experience where they leave with $1,700 of supplies on average. I will say that in the case of Longmont, it's a specific ask that also uh, that also supports our satellite resource center. We work with a Wild Plum Center, which does great, great work. Um, this is kind of the secret sauce of a precious child is we work with lots of agency partners. And some of those are satellite resource centers where we forward project supplies that are right near to the point of need in the community. So we would, with this funding, not just be sort of supporting the Empowerment Resource Center in Broomfield, we would use this funding to... You, purchase supplies and oversee the deployment of them to our satellite resource center at Wild Plum Center. Oh. That's wonderful. I'm happy to hear you partner with Wild Plum to do that. That's a great Absolutely. idea. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I have only sort of overlapped by making referrals there because um, um, I work with people who have open child welfare cases. Um, so I was curious about like the, um, concrete needs that you supply for folks. And, um, uh, I just wanted to hear about that a little bit more. For sure. Yeah. So our program, we purchased, uh, food, baby formula, hygiene supplies, home goods, toys, uh, baby essentials, uh, clothing, uh, culturally appropriate, nutritious food for our food pantry. So it's basically sort of this it meant to be, they could go to one location and get um, all of the things that they need to offset what they would spend that money on for other essentials for their lives. Uh, we allow up to three cost-free shopping experiences before we kind of refer them to one of our other agency partners for those ongoing needs. Um, and I, I don't think our satellite resource center has that limitation. So if it's coming to our main location, it's the three. If they're working with a satellite resource center, it's it's unlimited. Um, but that's kind of the, some of the examples of, of what we provide. It's they come into our location, they they take away all the essentials that they need for for home supplies. So how does that? So you know how does that work with? with the R center and the kind of work that they do as well with, because they have a closed closet, uh, they have a food pantry, you know, do, are you, are you in communication with them and, and, and collaborating there as well? I missed the reference to the arc center. Is that what you the, said? The R center. The R center. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, maybe there's some overlap, but my, my sense is that the wild plum center is um, always having folks come into it needing those supplies and oftentimes we don't kind of get the the credit back to a precious child it's not sort of the the satellite resource center provided by a precious child we operate kind of humbly in lots of satellite resource center to provide those things i think there's hundreds of families we counted and it was 640 yeah, 640 
I'm, so I'm sorry, sure that, that the need always outstrips the resources. That's just the reality, right? Sure. I mean, I totally get it. I guess I'm just I'm just asking about, you know, it's great that you're partnering with, with, with Wild Plum. I'm just wondering if there's any other partners like that provide similar services in the area. Quite possibly, absolutely. And with churches and everything else, I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, we have Wild Plum reaching out to us all the time for more supplies. So I think the the need is is much greater than what's being provided currently. Okay. Can you talk about some challenges that your organization's facing or is, is starting to face with the changing of times and infl inflation? For sure, yeah. It's, it's tough to convey and all of you work kind of closer to the space than most so you can understand this, but it's it's hard to convey sort of the life on life work that's needed in order to really turn things around with some of these family situations. Um, one one th one reason we named it the Empowerment Resource Center, we used to have two separate things, the Empowerment Center that would do sort of the uh, resource navigation, case management, the life on life work with families. And then we had a resource center, which is the, the shopping experience, if you will. We combine those because when they come in for those necessities, that's a golden opportunity for us to kind of assess what is that sort of composite of needs might be immigration assistance, might be legal assistance, might be domestic violence uh, relief, might be addiction recovery. Um, there's all kinds of things that happening inside of a family that has needs that it goes beyond that resource. So I think that's some of the challenge that we're seeing. How do we bring the enough funding online to give that focused life on life attention and that takes people, that takes time, that takes an appointment where you spend the two hours kind of delving into things. And that can be a, an emotional, emotionally trying event for this, this family, uh, this mom, in most cases, to go through that. So that's a challenge just to how do we serve as many as possible while also going deep with families to, to really solve some of those root causes. Wonderful. And are your surveys indicating, like your surveys that are, um, that you're providing to your participants, is is there indicators there that you're making a difference, that you folks are meeting needs? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah, we have some great stats that say 93% of those who leave the interactions with us feel more hopeful about their future. 88% of kids feel like they're now, you know, on the right track to as a family towards, you know, self-sufficiency. So we we have these survey results that are all above 80% across all these measures of feeling more hopeful, more empowered about their future. Um, and it's exciting, but we also know that there's so many more out there that we need to serve. And awesome. lastly, is it just Boulder County that you serve? No, we serve all eight counties um, across the Denver metro area. So um, I know this grant was sort of a four-pronged fork that kind of went off to different areas. And this is the long mark, long, long month, uh, prong of the fork. But, uh, but yeah, we serve all eight Denver metro counties. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And yes, the, the work you do is really wonderful. I, I have... Tons of participants always asking me for referrals to Precious Child, and 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 they are always so excited and hopeful about it. So thank you for the work that you do. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, anytime. Any of we have a busy season coming up with Precious Gift and holiday season. So if any of you have other spheres where you'd like to come volunteer, we'd like to take love taking volunteer groups. It's one of the our favorite things to do. Thank you. And you did it in under 10 minutes, so to appreciate that. Uh, so then I'll give you your five minutes, uh, and you don't have to use them all, but if anything you want to share to the board, then this is the time to do it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I've lived in lots of different places. Maybe all of you are, are Colorado natives who have only lived here your whole life, but I lived in a lot of cities, and as a nonprofit professional across lots of different organizations, being a board member like you all, every city tends to have its one child serving nonprofit that kind of rises above the rest for whatever reason. Um, and uh, having worked in, in the Denver metro area with a lot of wonderful organizations, I, I left my consultancy to work strictly with a precious child because 
I believe so strongly in what they're doing. Um, this is really that one child serving nonprofit that is, you know, trying to meet all kinds of needs. We serve 57,000 children in need in 2022. And it looks like we're going to outpace that. At, at, we're going to go beyond that in 2023, but there's tens of thousands of more that need our help. Um, Longmont, I know, is just one piece of the puzzle, um, and but it's it's one that you know is on our radar because we we don't want to focus strictly on city and county of Denver. We don't want to focus strictly on the main areas that get all of the attention. Um, we know that there's lots of areas around Denver um, that get get quite a bit less and we are looking to expand our support to the Longmont area, Longmont area because we know there are thousands of children in need there um, so this funding would go a long way towards you know creating a huge stream going towards the wild plum center and possibly standing up other satellite resource centers as well so if you're looking for you know if you're looking to fund an organization that has a lot going for it, that knows what children need, that knows working with families, that's connected to hundreds of other agency partners in the area and has the ability and scale to really deliver services to the children of Longmont, I think a precious child would be a wonderful partner to, to you. So, All right. Thank you so much. Sounds like you do a lot of great things. Thank you for uh, your time tonight. Appreciate it and hope you have a good night. Thank you so much. You too. Take care. Thank you. All right. And so, yes, for our next group, we're going to let uh, Effa in. I think, are they next? I think they're next, right? They are. Okay. So, yeah, you can stay on, Crystal. We're just going to ask that uh, you let me and Martha handle the questions. And I'll let them know that. So, I'm sure they'll be happy to see you. All right, good evening. Make sure everybody gets connected. Hello, Jake. Hello. Hi there. Hey, Cami, how are you? I'm good, Alberto. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you again. Hey, Guillermo. Um, Hello. So I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first. I know you all know Crystal, um, great partner at EFA, but she's also our board member. However, because she does work for you, she can I, I she can stay on the meeting later. She can stay on, but she cannot ask questions, and she will not be scoring your application. We have other board members that will be scoring it just to make sure that we we don't we don't do any conflict of interest type of situation. Okay, uh, so some quick housekeeping. Uh, sorry for being late. You know, as you know, we just get into these conversations and time gets away from us. Um, so this meeting is being recorded as it is a public hearing. Um, I will introduce Martha as our board member. Again, you know Crystal, and uh, uh, and then um, let you guys introduce yourselves as quickly as possible, and then we'll jump into 10 minutes. We may not use it all, and that's okay. And then you'll have five minutes to share, and again, you don't have to use it all either. Um, but why don't we get started? Martha, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi there, um, Martha Wilson, and this is my first year on the board. And of course, you know me, I'm Alberto. Um, Project Coordinator for Human Services. You don't see Brenda, she is in the background. Uh, she manages these meetings and, and does the scheduling. Why don't you quickly introduce yourselves and then we'll get right into the questions. Okay, hi, it's uh, lovely to see everyone this evening. Thanks for um, giving us an opportunity to talk with you. I'm Cami Siemens. I'm the Director of Programs at EFA. I'm Jake McClelland, the Institutional Giving Officer at EFA. And I'm Guillermo Carrera. I'm the housing program manager here at EFA. Awesome. All right. So, Martha, do you want to start with the first question? Um, sure. Um, I very much liked your application. Um, I thought that the section that highlighted that you have 80% of your participants who are able to make it into a more stable housing situation was an important statistic that you shared. 
Um, I was a little bit confused about, or it wasn't con specifically clear if this um, $20,000 was gonna be specific to the families living at Atwood or if it was gonna help in some other way. Can somebody provide clarity on that? Sure, I can give background there. Um, so the 20,000 would be uh, treated as restricted funding um, from the city of Longmont, EFA would treat it as restricted funding and it would go specifically to, um, I, I don't have the budget in front of me, but the housing resource navigator at Atwood House, either entirely or uh, in part to her salary and taxes and also like administrative yeah. facility. Yeah, that's what your program budget and that's just perfect, yeah. And one more note, just aside, like that is the, the data that we include in that application is specific to Atwood House. So that is the successful exit rate for Atwood. Um, broadly, we also have that similar successful exit rate across all of our housing, but any of the data you see in there is specific to that site. Okay. Um, it, it definitely suggested it. I just wanted to be sure. Um, sure. Uh, and then, so I'm a, a therapist, so I kind of view like Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs. Do you work folks up the triangle or is it specific to housing and just that initial stabilization items? So are you asking about the services that we provide in terms of care management, Martha? Is that yes. what you're... Okay. Yes, like with case management and just overall well-being I'm trying to see like what all is covered yeah so um the housing resource navigators are some of our most seasoned resource navigators um out of all of the programs that EFA provides and that's because they really are building one-on-one -on -one relationships with families um, you know, what we often see is families who are moving from our short-term housing into um, the transitional housing program. And you happen to have one of our rock star resource navigators at the Atwood site. She is, I really should um, let Guillermo tell you a little bit about her, but essentially um, in short term, they meet with their families once a week. And then in our transitional housing program, they meet with the families once a month. And that includes goal setting. Um, it includes, uh, you know, we have a children, youth and families program that, um, you know, is very specific to the needs of the, the children as well. Um, and Guillermo, do you want to talk a little more about what, um, what Margie does specifically at Atwood? experienced resource navigator and she's been with EFA the longest on the housing team so yeah she's she's awesome um <clears throat> but yeah I mean um we I guess we do work off of I guess the Maslow's hierarchy right like we're establishing housing right off the bat that's a big one and then we are um uh you know we connect them with food services we work really closely with the Hour Center in Longmont, make sure they're accessing that food bank. They also have access as housing participants, even though they're outside of the city of Boulder, they can access our food bank in Boulder. So they have some options there. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know what else I can say about that. I mean, we um, we focus on like the protective factors, you know, like from the CFSA, that's kind of like the cutting edge thing. In, in the work we're doing, you know, so we're, um, I think we do address some of the the, the stuff you mentioned, but um, but we also do a lot of work trying to build up their support system. We have our children, youth and families program, which you saw in the application. And, <clears throat> you know, so we're trying to make sure they have some stability around the, the kids being okay at school so they can focus on the things, you know, like saving, reducing debt and, you uh, and, and applying for housing options. Awesome. So um, I have a I have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, one statement and then a couple of questions. First statement, you know, I look at as you can imagine, I look at tons of budgets, um, uh, and there is this this general rule in the in in the nonprofit world. You know, when it comes to finances and budgets, and that 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 whole 
three-legged stool, right? You want, you know, the 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 foundation money, the the individual donation money, the government money, or or whatever other. You you can have four legs. I mean, some folks have actually program income and stuff like that. Uh, and I want to commend you all. I mean, you guys do an amazing job at the private donations. Uh, and I'm assuming that that's all individual or corporate um, on your on your on your budget. Um, but yeah, I, I think you do. A, it sounds it looks really good to see that level of indiv mm -hmm. individual donations. Many, many agencies struggle with that that leg of the stool. It's a hard leg to stool to, to, to strengthen. So that was my comment. Um, my question, though, is on question one, I look at that question a lot uh, of the application. And one of the things it asks for is for your strategic goals. Um, and you have some really awesome programmatic goals. Um, and what I would love to see, uh, and I ask this of a lot of agencies, uh, is what are some of your agency goals around that, that continued? Because I know that, you know, inflation is hitting everybody. And I know that, that you know, I'm sure EFA is stressed as anybody else with labor costs, with the just the increased need. What what's what's the plan? Do you mean sustainability to, for mean EFA as as an agency? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, to your point, Alberto, you know, EFA really has um, a strong donor base that we're very grateful for. It's um, about, I think, 56% of our total budget, if I may. Love it. Yeah. It's beautiful uh, to see that. Um, and government funding increased a lot during COVID, but, um, you know, it is, we're just coming to the, we're sunsetting our current strategic plan and we'll begin the strategic planning process for the next five years this summer. Okay. Um, but I don't think that you'll see a tremendous, um, paradigm shift, you know, really EFA is continuing to build from a strengths-based perspective, the um, parent-child relationship in particular, but, you know, we're one of the main sources of um, family homelessness services, and that will, I think, continue um, until we're put out of business. Right. But, okay. I, but it looked like you were going to add to that. What Sure. Yeah. Um, just briefly about funding. Yes, we are very lucky to have had extraordinary donor support over the pandemic and including after the pandemic. We're seeing and planning for sort of a reset at a higher level than we were pre-pandemic. I mean, our budget has tripled in size since then, and so are the donations that we've seen. And while there is a drop off in that funding, specifically from government funders and also from kind of one time pandemic era gifts from businesses and individuals and foundations, we are going to like I said, reset at a much higher level. And so there is kind of an expectation broadly that while we enter the strategic planning phase, we're going to continue to meet community demand as best we can. Um, we're not worrying about some multi-million dollar shift in our budget, but we are like aware of okay, those are, are forthcoming. Um, but as far as our goals and aspirations to continue to raise at a high level. We're definitely going to do that. We have strong relationships with funders. Um, some government funding has existed to like before, during and beyond the pandemic. Um, so we're not anticipating a huge shift there. Uh, okay. So it is one part, continue to meet that community demand, continue to meet the high level of need that we're seeing specifically for basic needs services, and then more broadly to expand pro programming towards family strengthening, multi-generational poverty alleviation and economic empowerment. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for, yeah. Cause I know that ARPA's ending and you know, CVRF ended. So yeah, that's why I was, I was asking about that. All right, so we have reached our time. Uh, and so you guys have five minutes to share. You don't have to use all of it, uh, but you have five minutes to share whatever you want to share to the board. Well, you know, Guillermo, I hate to put you on the spot, but would you want to talk a little bit about um, the employment support funding? I think that's one of the um, unique programs that EFA engages in and really is a significant support, especially for um uh, some of our families that find it harder to find uh, traditional work and housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, basically, um, with how high the cost of, of housing is in our area, and I guess all over, um, 
you know, and, and our, our folks being really low income, um, we've tried to find solutions and, you know, helping them increase their income. So uh, our employment fund is um, set up to uh, help um, individuals in our program um, get equipment, get certifications, uh, clothing, whatever it is they might need for their current job or for a job opportunity, or a lot of the times to start a business, you know, start a, a kind of a side hustle business to increase their income. So um, <clears throat> we do up to $500 in items uh, per individual once per year. Um, for things like equipment and clothing, um, really common stuff is people starting like landscaping businesses and we help get them some equipment, uh, where they need, you know, steel toe boots and, you know, whatever it might be. And then we also have, uh, our certifications, which we go a little higher there. We can do up to $800 for, um, certifications and we've seen um, like one person at Atwood got their commercial driver's license. Uh, we recently had a couple of people, um, they're still working through getting their real estate um, certification. Um, <clears throat> and then one of our most recent ones is um, somebody that was a plumber, but in a different country. So we're paying for their certification to be a, a master plumber here in the States. Um, so yeah, it's kind of what that looks like. Did I miss anything, Cammie? No, I think that's a great description other than to add that that is tied to um, goals that the um, participant is working towards along with the support from our resource navigators. And um, Margie there at Atwood is, I would say she's responsible for probably 75% of the use of that funding. So um, she she really does a great job with the families there at Atwood and making sure that they um, not, not only have, you know, some employment support, but um, making sure that it it's um, realistic as well, you know. So uh, I think the, yeah, the last one was the plumber that you talked about, but then we've also had folks that have gone into the police academy, um, furniture making, um, lots of different, uh, a barber we've had, we trained. Yeah. So, yeah. Baking business, you know, food yeah. business, popular one. Cleaning. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. That is, that's great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate all that EFA does here in Longmont. Appreciate the collaboration you have with the R Center and other part, local partners and uh, yeah, have a great night. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Appreciate talking you to too. you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Our next group is uh, Via. And I see two Lisas. I think she's trying to decide which one to use. But I'm okay. Sure. All right. That's fine. If you want to let them in, that's fine. Hello, Lisa, Ryan, and Frank. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Sorry that we're running a little late. It just happens every year that way. <laughs> we don't intend to, and it just it just goes. Uh, so we appreciate your time. We know it's a later in the evening. Uh, so real quickly, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, we, are, of course, are recording this as this is a public hearing. It'll be on the City of Longmont's YouTube page. I'm gonna introduce our board members quickly and then I will, or they'll introduce themselves and then I'll give you a, a, a time to introduce yourselves. If you could do that as, as briefly as possible so that we can get straight into the Q and A, that would be great. And then at the end, if we have, uh, the goal is to give you five minutes. If we go a little bit over on the Q and A, we'll take a little bit of that time away from that, uh, but uh, to give you all a chance to share whatever you wanna share with the board. So I'm gonna start this time with Crystal. Hi, good evening. My name is Crystal Prieto. I'm a resource navigator for a local nonprofit, and I also work with the school district. It's And it's my first year here with the Housing and Human Services Board. It's a pleasure to meet you. All right. Thank you. Martha? 
Hi there, Martha Wilson. I am also in my first year on the board um, and I'm happy to hear what you have. Awesome. So, uh, and you all know me, Eliberto. Um, what you can't see is Brenda Palacio. She's in the background. She manages our, our meetings and, and schedule these. So why don't you all take a minute to introduce yourselves and then we'll go ahead and jump into the Q&A time. And we don't have to use the whole 10 minutes, but we usually do. So Frank, you're on, you're on, you're on the mute. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Frank Bruno. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Avia Mobility Services. And good evening. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Bitzer. I am the Director of Operations for VIA. Thank you. And I'm Ryan Avery. I'm the Grants and Contracts Manager at VIA. And in the context of this conversation, my job is simply to put the application request together. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and start the timer. Um, I saw that um, you mentioned that it's comparable to like Medicaid ride, flex ride, like that's the predominant amount of affiliation. So what is different about your program or what is specific to it? Uh, Lisa, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that. So uh, via the paratransit service that we have in uh, the city of Longmont, it is a door through door um, uh, service. We go into the house, help the people get their coat on, take them in where they need to go, uh, make sure that they get there safely. It's for riders that are 60 years of age and older and or have a disability. Yeah, our, our drivers will even, they'll, they'll help They'll take groceries in, they'll put groceries away, they'll help, you know, um, feed cats and dogs if if requested. <laughs> so all sorts of things. They're they're not trained um um caregivers, you know, but but they do go above and beyond what normal services available do. And you had mentioned Flex Ride. Um Flex Ride is uh a contract that we operate for RDD, but it's separate from the paratransit. Yes, we operate the entire flex ride contract for RTD. So I I have a quick oh sorry, Crystal, you go ahead first, Crystal. Oh yeah, no, my question was just around the DEI effort. So I saw you folks um have have not incorporated a DEI committee or uh, trainings to staff. Um, and it did say in your application, um, it's something that you're really, that you acknowledge is important and that you're planning on implementing in the future. And so how soon um, are you folks wanting to get that ball ro rolling? Um, because with so many employees, I, I it, it did say in your application, it's hard because you have so many employees. But um, you know, kind of going back to one of your comments with them being so close and even in some of the participants' homes, uh, really ensuring that you have that DEI aspect or that component involved. So how, how soon are you folks wanting to get something started? Have you created a committee? Are you thinking about creating a committee? Um, to talk about some of the progress in that area. Well, um, Ryan, if you have any comments after I after I yeah. handle this, yeah. um, please please share. So we, we're very committed to this issue. Uh, it's more than an issue for us. It's just the way we operate and the way we do business. Uh, we would utilize our board of directors uh, as, as we have with our strategic plan. And they are very much ingrained with this work with us. So I would, um, I'm expecting that in the first quarter of 2024, that we'll be um, working with the board to plan what we're going to do with the entire organization, including including the board of directors, and uh, as we as we seek to recruit new board members as well. Yeah, and and I've I've talked to this a few times with our HR director, our HR manager, and it's it, it's definitely it's been a high priority, but it's, even though the 
training costs are usually free. Um, getting everyone together and allocating their time can be very expensive and also time consuming and just difficult to coordinate. And with our business, um, with with employment and employment turnover, which is happening like a, like throughout the entire nonprofit sector, it's been really hard to keep and retain people. So that's kind of their number one priority. And she said, once we get this under control, then then they're going to take that on. So and we we up there. we actually have seen uh, quite a bit more stability in the last couple of months yeah. with respect to hiring and retention, although, as Ryan said, it really has been challenging for everyone, including, I'm sure, the city to some extent. Um, and when when Ryan mentions scheduling, that what we're talking about there is really the difficulty in bringing together the drivers who have disparate schedules. Um, you know, they start at all different times. Having said that, though, that doesn't prevent us from structuring training in, in ways that can still work. So we will still do that. And do we do that all the driver, anyone who works directly with, with clients, um, they do go through past training, that's passenger assistance, safety and sensitivity, where, um, you know, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is, is definitely a, a, a a part of that, just not the the main part, but it it is covered in part. So there is some some training there upon when they before they start. Wonderful, and I did see that you serve some of the mountain communities, and I can imagine how hard it could be for someone who maybe identifies as a senior or disabled and doesn't have a vehicle to get to their appointments. So I really commend the services. Like I'm 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 so happy and grateful for you folks in the community and. And the work that you do is really important and amazing. So thank you so much for all that you, you do. Thank you. So so Ryan, uh, I had a question, um, and I think you did this last year too. And I just want to just uh, so you're asking for fifty eight thousand from the city of Longmont, right? Yeah. Um, how do you break that up between paratransit and the mobility option? Because they're two different things, right? One is right. actual rides, door to door, like you mentioned, and the other is more like case management, like helping people figure out their own transportation situation, right? Right. So what's the breakdown there? I didn't see it in the in the program budget um, that you turned in, which is fine. I just, I just would like to know what the, what the, because when I, you know, depending on, of course, scores and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to have to figure that out for any potential contract. Right. So I... You don't and, have to tell me right now. If you, if you can email but, me later, that'd be fine too. And, yeah, and Lisa, <laughs> Lisa may have a better handle on how that generally splits out, even in our operation overall. Yeah, you know, when when we're doing the trips, I mean, that's one piece of it, and I don't know quite the financial piece of how that's split up. But the mobility options piece, you're right, it is a separate piece. People call, they register people, and they also give people other options for transportation, but also for, you know, if they need to contact someone for food stamps or for housing or, you know, medical uh, uh, direction. Um, so they do um, work very hard hard to get them that information, send them what we call an ITP, which is an individual travel plan to so that they can have that information in writing or email um, to be able to look things up and, and get all the help that they need in all the places that they're interested in when they call. Right. Okay. Yes. I, I kind of figured that that was, that's how the program worked. Uh, but yeah. So Ryan, if you can do that and just send me an email, just so I know the, 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 the the breakdown right uh, yes. that would be really it's, that would be really yes. helpful. It's, it's 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 much easier to break it down as far as the transportation needs um you know for specifically for the city of Longmont we're usually like a million a million and a half uh total for for a year um right. where mo mo the mobility management is a little bit more difficult to figure out because people are calling in from all over right. our, our service areas so, but I, I can break that down for you and send it to you. All right, thank you.
So Frank, um, unless uh, unless Martha, you have a question. What I mean, as as you're talking about the challenges of you know retention and just the cost of everything, what's the strate what's the board looking at strategically as you move forward um, to to ensure the sustainability of, of VIA? Well, that's a, just that's big great. picture. Yeah, yeah, and we just finished our board meeting just a little while ago, so it's very very timely. And as I mentioned, we the board adopted our strategic plan two years ago, but have we've been updating it regularly, and you know, we talk about it at every meeting. So I I think for every all nonprofits and probably governmental entities, we're all waiting for the dust to settle to some degree, as we we've used that phrase, uh, post pandemic, post great resignation, and just the reality that look thinking about our mechanics, uh, the wage structure of the mechanics, we've always been fairly, you know, market driven there, but we've had to raise wages four or five times alone just to be able to retain and and attract when we needed to. So I here's the balancing point is trying to find uh, a way to not price ourselves out of the market and price um, local government out of the market in terms of contributions to an organization like VIA, that's really an extension of local government, and also be able to, to pay the folks what the labor market is demanding right now. So we're, we're going to be looking at that every month, and our goal is to find that point of, of stabilization, uh, continue to grow wages. I, I would prefer to see our wages in the 75th percentile for our drivers and our mechanics, because I think that's just a reality in the market today, um, what we're facing. And um, and I think that will enable us to continue to, to keep them. Uh, again, I, I think what we've all seen in the last two years has been kind of unprecedented with respect to people leaving, changing careers. Uh, we've never seen that before. So finding the stabilization point, uh, trying to stabilize uh, financial resources as well. And our goal is obviously long-term financial stability in, a, in addition to economic stability and environmental stability. All right, thank you very much. All right, so we went a little bit over, so I'll give you all about three minutes to share whatever you wanna share. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for the time tonight. I'm sure it's been a long afternoon. I would just like to say that we've the other thing we've never seen quite as dramatic is the demand that we're seeing now for our services on the paratransit side. It is, it's beyond belief how many people uh, really every day that are wanting to sign up for paratransit service to get a ride, get a trip, we're seeing very dramatic increases in the Denver metropolitan area, but we're also seeing pretty good increases in the Boulder, Longmont, uh, Brighton marketplace as well. And so that has me very concerned because that's not trips, those are people. And so I'm worried about someone's aunt, uncle, grandmother, mother, or dad that needs to go to the doctor or just needs to go get groceries or needs the quality of life connection. So. I can't stress enough how important you guys are in the in the in the overall mix of that. That so thank you so much. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, we appreciate what Via does for the entire county, but in particular for for, for Longmont. Uh, appreciate all your work. Thank so you. So have much. have a great night. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, and our next group is here as well, and we will have a break after that, and hopefully we can catch up a little bit on time so we can get done on time. So why don't you let Christy in? Hey, Christy, how are you? Hi, Alberto, how are you? Good, good. Uh, first of all, I apologize. We, you know, uh, we always want to stay on time, but we get into these great conversations and we always go a little bit late. So apologies for us being late. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. 
Uh, as you know, these are public hearings, and so they're being recorded. Um, and so that they will be available on the City of Longmont's YouTube page. I'm going to let the board members introduce themselves and then introduce the staff, and then I will let, give you a, 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 a little time to introduce yourself. And then you're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A and up to five minutes of you, your ability to share. If, if we go over on the q and I'll, I'll take a little bit about those five minutes. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, uh, why don't I start with uh, Martha this time? Hi there, Martha Wilson. Um, I am in my first year on the board. Happy to hear from you tonight. Crystal. Hello, my name is Crystal Prieto. It's a pleasure to meet you folks. I am. Uh, this is my first year on the board. I'm a, a resource navigator in the community as well as uh, work with some high-risk youth within the district. Awesome. Of course, you know me, uh, Liberto. Um, you don't see her, but Brenda Palacio is our executive admin, and she handles all of these meetings and getting all the stuff out to folks. So appreciate her. All right, why don't you introduce yourself, Christy, and then we'll start the timer. Wonderful. Good evening and very nice to meet you all. Uh, I am Christy Britt. I'm the executive director of Cultivate. Awesome. All right. Let's get started. Questions from the board. We can start. Um, so, Christy, can you talk a little bit about some services that your organization offers uh, compared to other organizations um, similar to yours that serve the older adult population? Definitely. So we try to be very intentional not to duplicate services and very uh, we're very collaborative and, and partner strongly with uh, the other senior service organizations in Longmont. So uh, the only other similar service is going to be transportation through VIA uh, as they, of course, have their paratransit service. Our we actually used to operate in partnership, and then as, as our organizations grew and evolved, um, we took the military veteran and veteran family member component of the older adults to provide the transportation to that grouping. A big reason for that is that a lot of our veterans, their uh, appointments, their appointments are at the VA facilities which are, of course, in Aurora, Cheyenne, Golden, Colorado Springs, and VIA doesn't go there. Um, and we do have veteran volunteers or even other just volunteers that are very willing to take those rides that can last all day. Um, so that's going to be the one, the one service that is similar. Um, the others are very complimentary. So our grocery delivery service, uh, we run that in partnership. You know, if we see not partnership, but it, it, with referrals in mind. So if we see that somebody's having difficulty preparing their own meals, we're definitely going to refer them to Meals on Wheels, and Meals on Wheels does the same for us, uh, just really to make sure that they have that whole uh, cadre of available resources to them. Thank you so much. And yeah, that's wonderful that you're able to provide veterans um, with that transportation because those hospitals are really far away. <laughs> yes. And those appointments are not easy to navigate. They, it, yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> um, in the write-up and the application, um, although it didn't use this, this these specific terms, what I kind of gathered from it was you're trying to create like independence and dignity for your clients. Um, can you tell us more about that? And um, I guess what keeps you passionate about serving that particular population? Absolutely. And just to clarify me personally or the organization being passionate about it, because I can speak to both. <laughs> I'd like to hear about both. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah. So, you know, as there's a whole movement, it's called, it's called changing the narrative. And it's, it just talks about how um, society has viewed aging as such a negative concept. Right. Um, and this, this has become, this is more in the recent years that it's really become a something that people are recognizing that it's like, hey, wait a minute, this is ageist. 
So we've been around since 1972. Um, so we've known that for 50 something years. But we're really glad, we're really excited to see that there's there's conversation around it because aging in and of itself, it's just a part of life. And sure, as as our bodies change and as our bodies age, and uh, you know, there are things that we no longer are able to do like we did in the past, right? I say that all the time. I'm like, man, 10 years ago, I could have done this. But that's just a normal part of life. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, in that example for me personally, it doesn't mean that I'm any less. It just means I have to do things differently. And so that's where the independence and dignity piece comes in for us uh, as an organization is that, you know, really approaching the aging process as what it is. It's just part of life. And so ensuring that we are treating all of our clients and all of our volunteers and our volunteers are doing the same. Uh, we're, we're just interacting with dignity. We're not in there because, oh, we feel sorry for someone. No, someone needs groceries. They don't have the ability to get to the grocery store. And so we're able to provide that service. And it, you know, it could be the difference. Some of those services could be the difference between somebody being able to stay in the home that they've been in for decades, which is familiar, which is comfortable. And, you know, people don't like to move. Most people don't like to move at any age, um, you know, let alone having to move because there's just a few things you can no longer do the same way you used to. And so really providing that independence of, of our clients being able to make that choice and all of our, our programs really promote that freedom of choice. You know, we don't dictate what they can or, uh, of course, we have some restrictions on what they cannot order from the grocery store, but that's just, you know, all around. Um, but but there's that freedom of choice to be able to order what they want from the grocery store, you know, hire or, or ask for a volunteer in the same way they would hire a handy person to come make some modifications in their home um, and ask for as much or as little service as is right for that individual. So that's where that independence and dignity piece comes in, is that we're just there to provide that service that is needed. Um, and it, you know, that's that. You know, and, and that's organizationally what keeps us passionate about what we do is that everybody needs help in some way. Um, we happen to focus on the older adults and the seniors, and we have our specialties of, you know, really being able to provide uh, those services that may are needed a little bit more, perhaps because of some limited mobility or perhaps some limited uh, visual impairments, things like that, that we're just able to come in and and then our volunteers make that connection, our clients make those connections. Um, and it's really that human-centered piece that as an organization keeps us passionate about what we do and uh, providing that reprieve from isolation. And we get that feedback even from our volunteers is that it it's just as fulfilling because it's just that human connection. Um, so we're you know, our services and our, our us as an organization making that connection provides that for both sides. And that's amazing. Um, me personally, very quickly, uh, I I'm, grew up in a biracial household. My mom is actually from Korea. And uh, so that culture that I was raised in is that the families take care of our elder family members. Um, so I genuinely had no idea whatsoever up until about 10 years ago, which is right before I, I came in to cultivate, that the need for senior services existed. I lived in this little world based on my culture and my upbringing. Um, why do we need these? Well, <laughs> We do, because not everybody is raised in that culture and not everybody has family, either by choice or by location, uh, that can 
that can provide that service. Um, so as I watched my mom be the caregiver for my grandpa in the last uh, several years of his life after, um, you know, and, and watching that difficulty because, you know, my mom would try to hire maybe a little bit of extra help, but there was a language barrier because he spoke uh, very little English because he immigrated here very late in life. Um, so, you know, I really watched my mom be that primary and almost only caregiver. And it really opened my eyes to understand the need um, and watch experiencing that from the outside, um, you know, and having my mom seeing what she did and, and what's really needed to care for somebody as they age in that way. Um, just really is my driving passion behind this because I'm like, wow, you know, God, I wish everybody had someone like my mom um, and, and what I saw her do, but they don't. So let's see what we can do to build that in our community. Right, thank you. So we are approaching our time. Um, so I'll give you, uh, and you don't have to use them. Uh, I'll give you your, your five minutes uh, to share anything you want to share. Um, you can use uh, up to five minutes. Um, I don't know if I, I mean, I, I don't know if I have anything specific to share, you know, that's outside of what's, you know, what's in there that I provided. Um, just really the need for our services is what we're really seeing here in this, this past year and, and continuing, I think, into next year is a regulation is our our world, I suppose, begins to normalize uh, post pandemic. So we're really starting to see our numbers go back to what they were um, pre pandemic, which for us is is really a good thing to see because for quite a few years, uh, people weren't putting in medical requests, which means they weren't going to the doctor. Uh, and that's not good for anybody. So we're really pleased to see that People are starting, our, our clients are starting to come back and really normalize the use of our services. And we're also seeing some of our other services like our grocery program, those numbers are even going down. Uh, and as we do our surveys and things, it's because we're seeing that our clients are feeling more comfortable and able to go back to the stores and wanting to get out and have that connection. Uh, so it's just, it's nice to see our, our numbers change back to I guess what we're used to, I'm not sure there's a a, a normal anymore, um, but we're building that new baseline. And so, uh, you know, we're just seeing some of those shifts. And um, I think that speaks to our community and and how we're building back and, and getting back out there and, and doing our healthy things again. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for for what you and Cultivate do in our community. You provide an important resource for our, our older adults in the community. Appreciate um, the work that you and your volunteers do. So um, once again, thank you for being here tonight and sharing and answering our questions and have a good rest of your night. Great, thank you. Very nice to meet you. Good night. Good night. All right, folks, so we have the opportunity to get back on track. If we take a shorter break of five minutes, uh, then we can start at eight with El Comité and finish up with the last three agencies. I'm done with that. I'm All good. right, so I'll, I'll see you in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. And we need to sure. Good evening, Edwina. How are you? Hey. Hi. Let's see. Oh, we got a whole crew. Great. Yeah. All right. You're just down the street from me. Awesome. Hi. Hi. Hello. All right. Well, good evening to everybody. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Um, and then we will get started with the Q and A uh, section. And then, if we have, uh, if we have uh, some time, we'll give you all some time to share whatever you want to share. But let me start by saying, you know, as you know, this is a public hearing, uh, and it is being recorded, uh, and will be on the uh, City of Longmont's YouTube page. Um, 
I'm going to introduce our board members real quick, and then I'll give you all a chance to introduce yourselves briefly, and then we'll get started with questions. So let's start with Crystal right now. Hi, good evening. My name is Crystal Prieto. I'm a resource navigator for a local nonprofit, and I also work with the school district. It's a pleasure to meet you folks. Hi. Hi. Martha. Hi, I'm Martha Wilson. Um, this is my first year on the board, and I'm happy to hear from you tonight. Hi. All right. All right. And you know, of course, you all know me. I'm a Liberto Project Coordinator for Human Services. And who you don't see on the screen is, is uh, uh, Brenda Palacio. She is our amazing wizard that gets all of these things scheduled. So I'll give you guys a minute to go ahead and introduce yourselves, and then we will jump into the question and answer time. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Riley. Um, Riley Nelson. I'm the development coordinator at El Comite. Awesome. I'm Rita Salazar, and I am the uh, vice president of El Comite. Hi there, right. I'm Becky Barclow, and I've been on the board, what, seven years? Five years? I don't know. Long time. I've been here a long time. <laughs> and she's our board president. Sarah Levinson, um, board secretary. All right. So let's jump into question and answer time. Can you hear us okay, by the way? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. I can start. So um, I love what your organization does. I refer so many people to you guys all the time um, that I meet with. And so I just really want to commend like the work that you do. Um, I know that organizations shift periodically in the services that they provide, especially with feedback that they get from participants or just the needs in the community. So if, could you get a, give a brief description of what type of services or like what the main services that you offer folks here in the community are? Yeah, um, so the main services are based around our three goals of um, increasing self-sufficiency, improving educational opportunities and being a community bridge builder. Um, so the majority I would say is case management services. Um, and that encompasses a lot of different things. Um, our three case managers work with, I mean, um, they help with immigration applications, um, letting people know when their court date is and maybe setting up a Zoom for them to do it in the office, um, unpaid wages, um, they meet with case managers, um, if they need like a attorney consultation. So they meet with the case manager first to make sure we refer them to the right attorney. Um, and yeah, really anything case management wise. Um, and then we do have, um, our education classes, which includes ESL, uh, GED and citizenship. Um, and then we also have learning sessions that um are kind of slow to resume since covid but um but we want to revamp those um and like continue them more and then being a community bridge builder is most of our like um collaborations with other agencies which can be referrals or um we do have office hours for like um uh, boulder county health and human services um sally comes here and talks um talks to clients and gets them set up for the OmniSalute program, stuff like that. Um, and then also our partnering attorneys. So we have about eight and I think like six come to the office. Um, so like Ian McKinley, um, Perez Law Firm, um, Ramos, Ramos um, Bill Van Dusen. Yes. And so a couple of them we referred and they go to their office, but most um, most come to the office and then we'll do like low cost consultations that are just $20. So that's that's most of everything we do. But you, you know what the services we offer really are? A friendly ear to listen to the problems you're having and the opportunity to get help and the referrals. Crystal, as you well know, the referrals to go where you need to go to get the stuff done that you need to get done. 
but um, I think a lot of it is relationship based. No, absolutely. And, and everybody that I speak to that is it's some type of disconnection that they have or un, being unfairly treated or wronged by an employer. So thank you so much for the work that you do and the advocacy that you provide for these families and that connection. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was definitely um, impressed by your statistics that you shared, um, like your clients being 99% Latino. Um, and then you had, I don't know if it was the most diverse, but definitely top three most diverse um, boards um, in the area. Um, how do you um, keep and maintain such a high number? On the border clients. Um, on the board. Well, I think that a lot of us uh, have wanted to serve El Comité and really um, have the mission in our hearts. So in the last two years, everybody that we've asked to be on the board has agreed to be on the mm -hmm. board. Recently added uh, Tim Edstrom from Bagley Law Firm. He's a Spanish speaker and he works with uh, a lot of immigrants and he's our last addition and he, he the mission is in his heart so when we asked him to join he was very agreeable because he's wanted to serve in a different way than just his occupation so um i think that's that's why we've been able to do that because everybody we have on the board has a high level of commitment to the community. So I think we've been very fortunate to have found those people uh -huh. and selected them and they've said yes. We've had really good luck with our selection process for the board. We've gotten some real good board members in the last two years. And we have a big diversity on the board as far as life experiences. Um, I um, started working with El Comité probably in 1999, I met Marta and done a collaborative um, project with El Comité as a community member, and then supported them when I was a city council liaison to El Comité. And then um, we also have um, Bryn Kreider, who is one of our um, newer board members. And Bryn is actually a ESL teacher at Front Range Community College. So she really has a heart to work with this community. And um, her investment in El Comité um, is not only that she's um, a teacher and she's uh, bringing students along but she's also significantly younger than the rest of us yeah. so when you look at diversity it's not just our experience on the board and um you know our ethnicities that we bring but also our diversity in age it's rare to find a board that's got somebody under 35 on it who's very active since I have you guys, um, I'm curious. I heard some rumors last year that you folks were putting together a program to help, uh, you know, uh, young people, maybe graduating out of high school, wanting to go to college, get some type of funding to do that. Did that ever come into fruition or? Um, that's like, yeah, I'm, I don't know if that was something that we had talked about. Um, there is another organization um, with Latinx Mark's voices, Latinx Historia. voices with um, Martha uh, Moreno and Vic yes. Bella okay. and yes. Ray Rodriguez. If they, I know they're doing stuff with kids and scholarships. Um, so maybe it was that. Um, yeah, probably. But I, I will say that we have had um, uh, several younger people come in like this year um, who were asking about scholarship opportunities um, and the case managers were able to like um, research for them and help show them like where they could go um, to find those resources um, and maybe printed out information for them, um, possibly um, help them submit an application. I'm not exactly sure, um, but I know people have come in for that. Well, it sounds like you're pointing them in the right direction, which is just as impactful. So yes. thank you. And, 
And so, uh, folks, I have a question. So there's a board member that couldn't be here, and I want to paraphrase this question because I'm not going to ask it the way that he would ask it because it's his, it's his question. And, and, and when I look at his question, it's really around how do you uh, – how does it go meet there? You work with a lot of folks uh, that have an immigration story. How, how does their – how does their their story um, impact how you do your work? How does that immigration story that, that that you work with? How does that impact the work that you do? You know, um, I was born and raised in Colorado Springs. My family's been in the state of Colorado for like ever. Right. Do you all know when when I filled out? I started volunteering with El Comité, filling out citizenship paperwork, and I get to take a look at some of the tests or test questions that they'd be asked, I couldn't even pass that test now. And to ask these people, you have to help because they're asked to do things that I wouldn't even pass probably in high school. I don't remember doing a whole lot of work in history, but you just have to help because at the end, what we're all looking for, we're all looking for better lives for our families. Whether you came from Mexico, Ecuador, or the Ukraine, we all just want better for our kids. And I, I think as a mother of grown children and a grandmother of four, for me, it's, it's about just letting people have the same opportunities that I had growing up in this country. And Thank we you. have a very powerful story that was shared with us by um, Jeanette, one of our caseworkers that does a lot of the citizenship um, paperwork, um, the bulk of it. There was a woman who um, had been a client years ago, 20 years ago or more, Uncle Day, and uh, she had a nephew he helped, she helped um, uh, come across the border, um, not legally. And she had been turned down once for citizenship. And just recently, she's come back and said, I really want to get my citizenship. And, um, but I have this black mark against me because I helped my nephew. And um, we were able to work through Jeanette. We, Jeanette, was able to work through that issue and have her be able to successfully file her citizenship paperwork. So to me, here's a woman who um, had no hope of becoming a citizen and was told that she wasn't because of this one thing she did to help her family her nephew, that that was going to be um, something that prevented her, but now she's able to do that. And the fact is that we never stop trying for our clients. Mm -hmm. There's never going to be a time that we can't find a way um, or make a, a path um, become apparent for somebody. We just don't stop until they get their help. And, and I'll add one thing. Um, when she got her interview date, um, she knew she needed to study and so she um, started coming to the office um, and we set up her, set her up on a computer because she's a little older. I don't know if she even has a computer at home. Um, and we would get the, I don't know what it is, like some website where you can do a practice, pra practice exam. Um, and so she came like the first day she came and then like she came every single day like of the week until her, um, until her test. And she also went to our like, um, evening citizenship t uh, class and yeah so she did that for I think at least two weeks like every day and she knew we would set her up every day because and she's um, friendly with everyone and then she got her um, she went to her interview and passed and she came I think that day or the next day and came and take took photos and thanked everyone so yeah. Awesome. So we, we have passed our time. Uh, so I'm going to give you all three minutes to, to, to any last closing statements you want to make. Well, I, I think you probably know that we're in transition and I've been really proud of this organization because the staff is, is working so hard at um, continuing the services at a very high level, supporting each other, getting all the work done, even though we don't have an executive director at this time. Um, and the board is coming in and uh, sitting at the executive director's desk um, during the day and being able to support the staff in inter yeah. intermittent level. Um, and so I, I have just been exceptionally impressed by the professionalism and the camaraderie and the service level that 
is still being provided here, although we do not have an executive director. Um, and I, I wanted to assure the community that we're still providing the high level of service that El Comite has provided in the past. And the investment, I'm, we're really hoping that this year you will fund us with the full amount that we've asked for. Um, every um, dollar you put into El Comite, um, you may not know it, but it uh, reaps a lot of benefits to the city of Longmont. Every time we get a worker who's been cheated out of wages, um, his, his pay, his or her pay, that's money that comes back into our community. The family buys groceries, school supplies, clothing. So that money comes back in sales tax receipts to the city. And um, just what we did for the census, so many more people were ended up on the census count in Longmont due to the efforts of El Comité that it increased the amount of money the city was going to receive by how much did we think? It was, it was like three or four, it was millions is what it was. And Boulder County got money from us too. So we helped with the city of Longmont and Boulder County's coffers. I mean, we even do that. That's how good we are. <laughs> we bring the money to you so you can give it back to us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, love the thank work you. that El Comité does and, and uh, appreciate you all. So have a great rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Too. Bye. Bye. It was nice Bye. meeting you all. Thank you for your work. I know this has been a long slog for you. <laughs> it, these are long evenings for sure. Oh, very long. <laughs> So have a great night and thank you for all that you all do. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. All right. Bye bye. All right. So our next group is already waiting and we're only about two or three minutes behind. So it just it just goes like that. Why don't we let uh, this is a new group that has not applied before. This is the first time applying. All right. So good evening, Ricardo and Peter. Can you and Pete? Can you all hear me? I can, I can hear you. you. I can see you. Can you uh, hear me too? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So welcome. Um, thank you for being here tonight uh, to tell us a little bit about answer some questions about your application. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as you know, this is a public hearing is being recorded and will be on the City of Longmont's uh, YouTube page. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the board members that are here tonight and then give you a chance to quickly introduce yourselves. Then you'll have 10 minutes of Q&A and then five minutes to share whatever you wanna share. If we go a little bit over in the q and I'll take a little bit from that five minutes. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that. So let me introduce the board real quick. Let's start with Martha. Hi there, Martha Wilson. Uh, this is my first year on the board. And then Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal Prieto. I'm a resource navigator for a local nonprofit and I work with St. Brain Valley and this is also my first year on the board. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice, right. welcome. I think you all know me. I'm Alberto Mendoza, project coordinator for human services here for the city of Longmont. You can't see her, but Brenda Palacio is our executive admin and she kind of helps coordinate all of these meetings. Uh, so why don't you all take a, a minute to just introduce yourselves and then we'll then get started. All right, I can I can start myself. My name is uh, Ricardo Cabrera. I am the founder and president of My Wealth Being. Um, it's our second year or so as a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we've been working to create our programs and, and test them out, pilot programs and so on. Um, um, Latino Chamber, I was part of the Latino Chamber for a few years back. That's where most people recognize this guy. Uh, right. You know, before that, you know, I, I was uh, in the medical industry, traveled a lot, visited places and uh, worked as a sales guy. I was a software developer for some time in my life and uh, and a golf coach. That's a awesome. real estate agent, golf coach. Uh, but <laughs> Thanks, now, Ricardo. Yeah. So I can Pete. help with that in, in many ways. So, Pete, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Pete Salas. I've uh, uh, been around for a long time. I, I I spent the last 25 years of my career in the uh, uh, county commissioner's office, and I managed the economic uh, vitality funding uh, uh, program for the county for a number of years. And I've served on, I don't know, uh, 15 or 20 boards. 
as a founding member of the Latino Chamber of Commerce, and I served uh, last from uh, 2019 to 20, end of 2020. So uh, I managed a couple of uh, networking groups, uh, including the Boulder County Latino Coalition, and uh, and I am on the board and the treasurer of my wealth being so. Awesome. awesome, thank you. All right, let's start with questions from the board. All right. I can go ahead and go. Okay. So I was super excited to learn about your organization. I'm so happy that you guys popped up and you're going to be doing the work that you're doing. Um, talk to me a little bit about your vision. What do you What do you folks see down the pipeline and 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 what is it that kind of drives you uh, to do the work that you're going to be doing and are currently doing now okay ahead, well, do you want to take that peter go ahead, go no go ahead well um let's start with uh you know the vision that i have and the vision and the mission basically you know it's to um to help people create wealth for themselves over time, right? The, you know, personal finance is one of those things that they should teach in high school and they should teach it in, in college, you know, and they should give you all those basic things that are, you know, turn the light on so you know what you're doing now while you have a, you know, a long runway and it's easy to create wealth for yourself, right? Uh, when, uh, when one of the things that motivated me to start this um, you know, I'm going to jump all over the place here, is that throughout my career, there's always, you know, a 401k plan at work and this and that. And every once in a while, we'd get a financial advisor to come and, and help us out. And I never came out satisfied. You know, I mean, you know, long story short, all they wanted to know is, so which product are you going to buy? And I'm like, no, that, that doesn't help me. So, uh, so I started a, a system for myself, a spreadsheet that was turned out to be the mother of all spreadsheets. And that people would say, Ricardo, you should share this with the community because it took me, it answered all my questions, right? Um, so basically what we've created and the vision is to share with the community this uh, standardized process, right? It's a standardized process uh, to help people, you know, get out of debt. You know, it's step-by-step, step, right? Emergency fund, basic emergency fund, get out of debt, full emergency fund, which is what we call the foundation. And then we go through wealth generation strategies, right? So once you graduate from, now I can throw everything into home ownership, stock market, start a business. Those are the wealth generation pipelines. Um, and we walk people through in several ways through A to Z, right? Um, and the hope is that, you know, by turning the light on. So we have this edu with this workshop program that is, uh, you know, presented in many ways, but it's 10 topics, uh, you know, two hours per day, if you want to do it five days and so on. Uh, very dynamic, very, uh, very uh, inclusionary, meaning that uh, a lot of questions. Um, and then once we help people turn the light on and get the vocabulary straight and all that, then we do one-on-one -on -one consultations. So People will pick their path um, and then they'll call back and say, hey, well, now that I know this, help me a little bit. This happened or how do I do this? How do we do that? So we have, uh, well, the plan is to have coaches, financial coaches, not advisors. Coaches is the better word to guide people through the process. It's a lifelong process. So the idea is that once you get, we get you interested, we'll be there for years, right? I mean, the idea is that this, this nonprofit will continue throughout time so people can call back um, through their accumulation years, which is while we're working, and then through their depletion years, which is when you're not working anymore. Um, and that's, uh, that's a summary of the vision and the program and what motivated me to start it. And, well, I'm excited uh, that you guys are in the community. Uh, Thank you for explaining for, that. Yeah, from my yeah, from my perspective, uh, I've I, I've worked in human services forever, and it's really it's just a matter of, as Ricardo said, there's a larger vision, but there's some really basic stuff that people need to know. You know, how do you budget? How do you you know how do you manage the budget that you have? You know, all of those things that we that we weren't taught, and and the whole purpose. And one of the reasons I was in the Latino Chamber is because I believe that we. 
uh, that we need to create wealth within our community and and the power that comes with creation of wealth uh, so that we don't we're not reliant on other on other folks so it's an educational process uh, something that I think everybody needs to know I've got a 19 year old son and and, and and explain the part he's a business student now and explain the process to him and he's yeah dad no one's no one's ever taught us any of this you know they used to when people had checkbooks <laughs> no one taught people how to you manage a checkbook you know they get credit cards they don't know how to manage it so that's part of our our program is is to help people understand what what uh, what uh, finances are about given the language that they so if they have to go see a, a broker or a, a a credit union, whoever it might be, they have the language and they understand what's being told to them so that they can make wise financial decisions and, and move forward from there. So that's that's pretty much it for me in a nutshell. I, uh, stuff that I, took me years and years to learn. And and <laughs> I was one of those early credit card uh, debt people that uh, didn't quite know how to manage it. That's what we're trying to help people do. So, so Ricardo and, and Pete, um, talk to me about how, uh, you know, so there, so the workforce training and, and financial education. Um, how do you all work together? How are you different? Um, yeah, talk to me a little bit about that. Pete, you want to go first? Well, uh, I think that uh, part of it, and, and Ricardo's actually been doing the, the the heavy lifting in that regard. But uh, from my position, from my perspective, it's a matter of, of of partnering up and seeing where uh, those agencies like workforce are. What you know the programs that they have and how where where there may be some overlap and where we can supplement what they're doing uh, in a different kind of way. Uh, they uh, so that that that's how I look at it. So when I see uh, whatever workforce is doing and, and Ricardo has been more intimate uh, uh, with it than I am, but but really it's a matter of more partnering and collaborating and building some synergy around uh, working together uh, so that there's no try to eliminate the gaps that may exist. Okay. Yeah, so there are definitely parallels between what you know we're doing and what workforce. They have a department where right? that Boulder County they have their uh, their financial uh, coaching program. Um, so there are certainly parallels. There are other groups that are doing the financial classes as well. It's like the hot time. The state just came out with a department, a whole department for that. The uh, the Office of Financial Empowerment, um, and that's a new state office. So. Uh, Definitely a hot topic. So one one of the things that we that I hope to create with my wealth being is a, a tool, so a, a tool that works on your computer or on your app that will really guide you through this. Um, and, and but this tool is unique because it's not just for me. What I want to do is create a tool that I can share with other departments and they can use it as well. Um, so so there is something that you could take home. I mean, because it's really easy, you know, like explaining the, the rules of basketball. I can give you those in 15 minutes, right? But it takes a long time to be able to play the game and master, you know, everything. But if you have a tool that you can take home and that will help you through the different steps of, of the standardized process, which is pretty universal, really. I mean, I'm not inventing the process. I'm just hopefully uh, simplifying it and giving people the tools and strategies to, to use it. So the hope is that besides having my own audience, that I can share this tool with uh, a workforce, for example, or, or the Department of the Financial Empowerment, other, other financial coaches to use this tool and, and help case manage and help people guide. Uh, and it's a gap. There are a lot of people that can't go to a class, but they have a phone, right? Um, so, so we should be able to reach more people um, with this tool, right? Uh, but besides that, our classes, you know, we do our classes, our, our circle of wealth is what we call our workshop series. Uh, we do it online. We'll have a version that is self-directed uh, so they can do it uh, on their own time. Uh, we'll have them in the middle of the day and, you know, before and after work for uh, night shift and day shift people um, in English and Spanish. So that's ultimately the uh, the dream and the, uh, the vision for, for the workshop series and, and that'll be fishing i mean that's fishing for people to call us back for one-on-one -on -one consultations awesome okay so we got about 30 seconds left in the q a any last questions if not we can go to give them their time all right so i'm going to stop this timer and i will give you all your uh your five minutes again you don't have to use them all but you have up to five minutes 
All right, Pete, you're going to go first. Yeah, I'm not going to take a lot of time. Like I said, I think uh, the, the need is there. The uh, uh, We, as an organization, uh, can uh, broaden the scope of work that's being done, whether it's being done by uh, workforce or other agencies. And I think uh, I think we can be as efficient and as effective. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of our audience is going to be an audience that, that workforce doesn't have as an example. But there are other programs out there. And and again, basically the whole the whole purpose for me, and and, and what I'm want, would like to see is just just to see us be able to to educate our communities, and, and the communities that aren't getting it, uh, educate them about uh, the financial strength that they have, and uh, you know sometimes it's a sacrifice, and people people need to be shown how it pays off in the end, uh, and uh, so that that's really what I'm in it for. That's why I got involved in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and that's why I do the work that I do, uh, really to help people be more self-sufficient and not self-reliant on other on other programming. So that's for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, it's every organization's dream to be able to get people on their own. And, and, and you know, the government also is like, we're going to be here to help you so you can, you know, stand up and, you know, fly on your own. But um you know, for, for myself, you know, I can tell you, I, I've been lucky throughout my life in, the, in that I had the right people help me and guide me. Uh, and definitely a lot of, you know, lucky decisions that I've made that, that have put me in a good place to where not only to do what I'm doing, but, you know, uh, financially stable so I can retire comfortably. Um, and I want to share that with the community. Um, it's not rocket science, you know, and math is blind. So um, if I can, the more people I can help by turning the light on and showing just basics of, of uh, financial concepts uh, so they can create wealth for themselves. Um, you know, I can tell you this year in 2023 so far, we've gotten uh, 160 people in our program from Longmont. That's just in Longmont. Um, we've had uh, 163 people, uh, 60 people that have been in front of a workshop, and we, we've had 12 one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, I've had one person that has bought a house. We're hosting about two different websites for businesses, you know, mean the, the different tracks, right? Um, so they can start that, that their path. Um, and a couple other examples I can give you success stories, but this is just the pilot program. I, I'm excited to see what's going to happen once we really get out and start marketing the product and, and, the, and to the community. I mean, my, my ultimate goal is to, to touch 10% of the workforce. That means that's a lot of people, right? And this is like a five-year plan. Um, but my motivation is that to allow people to empower themselves um, and, and not realize, you know, 10 years before retirement that, you know, and what do I do now? Which is, you know, really hard at that point. All right. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing in the community. Appreciate and uh, have a great rest of your night. All thank right. You. Thank you. Take thank care. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Crystal and Martha. Bye -bye. And I see a Brenda there. I don't see her, but she's there too. Yeah. Very good. All thank right. you. Have a good thank night. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Please. All right, so we have our last for the evening. Thank you all. These are some of these are longer than others. Um, really appreciate you hanging tough. Our, our last one is um, uh, Katie Weiser from Long Rump Meals on Wheels. Hey, Katie. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Yes, you are the last one tonight. Yeah. How are you guys hanging in? <laughs> We're hanging in. It's been it's been a long one. Um, so first of all, thank you for being here tonight. Um, just some quick housekeeping. As you know, this is a public hearing and it is being recorded and will be on the City of Longmont YouTube page. Um, I'm going to introduce our board members real quick and uh, and then you can introduce yourself and then you will have there'll be a 10 minute Q&A time. Um, and then we, if there's time, uh, we'll have you give you ten, five minutes for you to share whatever you want to share. If we go a little bit over on the, on the 10 minutes, I'll take a little bit off of the, 
the five. Um, but yeah, let's get started with introducing the board members. Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal. Good evening. Um, I'm a resource navigator for a local nonprofit, and I also work with the school district. Um, and this is my first year on the board, so it's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Martha. Hi, uh, Martha Wilson. Uh, this is also my first year on the board, and I am happy to hear from you tonight. Nice. All right, why don't you just share Kate, Katie, and then we'll get started. I am Katie Weiser, and I am the Development and Communications Director at Longmont Meals on Wheels. Um, Carla Hale, our Executive Director, was hoping to join us tonight, but um, her mother died unexpectedly last okay. at the end of last week, or I guess over the weekend. So um, she's just not able to join us right now. And so this is the first time I'm fl fly flying solo. So we're lots of firsts tonight. All we'll right. Be... All right. So I'm going to start the timer. Questions from the board? I can start. Um, so Katie, Mills and Wills has been around for a really long time and the work that you folks do is amazing. Um, talk to us a little bit about like any new developments or trends that you're seeing needs in the community. Yes. Okay. Yes. I was just reviewing numbers before I got on tonight. So I would have the latest and greatest for you. <clears throat> 2019 was a huge year for us. And I go back to 2019 because it was the last kind of most normal to where we are right now. Um, and right now we're doing significantly more than we did in, in 2019. For all of 2019, we were averaging about 495 meals a day. And in September, we averaged 515 meals per day. Not to say that that is the kind of numbers we've put up all of this year. We've worked really hard this year to make up for three years of lost outreach. Um, for especially in the community lunch at the Longmont Senior Center, where members are still a little bit behind there, but they were very behind at the beginning of the year. Older folks just still were kind of cautious about it, I think, first and foremost. But there was also three years of missing outreach and opportunity and kind of shared stories. And so we've worked really hard to kind of increase um, usership there. We did a special this summer that we've continued that we're continuing through the end of the year where um, it's free on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays through Fridays are $2 and uh, Wednesdays and fri through Fridays are a little more expensive because we recently started a salad bar. Um, so that has been going well. Um, Really, the people who are paying $2 Wednesday through Friday are paying the same, but it's really created buzz. And I think they're telling their friends about it again. They're treating it as a community engagement meal again, instead of just coming and, and nourishing, you know, uh, nutrition wise, but also kind of nourishing their mind and soul. And so that's wonderful to see. Um, we've also made a lot of changes in home delivery. We were kind of just stagnant at the beginning of the year. Um, and so the first thing we, uh, the, the kind of what we did early in the year was we reintroduced um, tailored meals for folks who had special diet needs during the pandemic, um, unless it was for cognition reasons. We asked people to look at our published monthly menu and call and cancel on days they couldn't have the meal and order extra on days they could. So we started going back to tailoring uh, meals, especially things where they wouldn't necessarily know in the side dishes. Like if you um, can't have a lot of vitamin K, that's in the sides and we don't publish our sides ahead of time. So it was important to get back to that. We also, during the pandemic, um, I don't know if you know, but the USDA, um, reduce the amount of sodium allowed in your diet, especially for an older adult. And so there was a lot of tweaking on sodium and carbs. Then we started to get feedback that we had gone too far and our meals were too, we weren't able to do as much variety and they were too kind of boring and bland. So we looked at it again and around May, we made the decision that the, the hot portion would be what we count as lunch towards numbers and everything else would be snacks. And then now it's, it's we found the sweet spot. People are very happy and we're, we're taking on 
significant numbers of new clients um, every week. Um, so we're really in a period of growth right now, although for the whole year, you might not see it, but really around um, May is where we really started to see huge um, changes in, in seeing numbers return. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I have a follow-up, but I'm going to let them ask their questions first. Okay. Uh, I had more of a logistical question only because like, I know when I go to the grocery store, the prices like went crazily up like meat even. <laughs> so I'm just worried. I'm wondering about how that works into the like $2 costs or, or even for the people who get to have free meals, if that's impacting you all at all. Yeah, food inflation I'm, has been the most runaway of kind of the buckets of inflation since we've kind of been seeing it. It's been very difficult. Um, so we at home, we the two dollars per meal and the free meal isn't a huge impact because our community meals are much smaller percentage. So the good news is we were already kind of used to that bringing in less client income. We offer sliding scale for our home delivered folks. And um, so, yes, while prices have gone up, our expenses have gone up. It's um, what we're used to. Um, you know, it, it's what we're used to. We've um, we're doing it, and we've had a lot of retirements in the last two years. A lot of uh, staff members who really wanted to work to get us through the pandemic. And then once we were stable, um, we're ready to retire. And so we're really every, we're looking at how we can swap duties and share responsibilities and streamline with staff. And, um, you know, buying food is also very interesting because it is a two person job right now because there's so much volatility and this has been going on since 2020. So we're a little bit used to it as well. Comparing prices since the pandemic began has been a full-time sport. It takes people kind of looking at prices almost every day and comparing sites um, and really being ready. If you see a good deal, but you weren't planning on buying that until later in, in the month, you buy it now. And so it is a full contact sport right now, but the good news is we got practice in 2020 and we're just continuing. So, so that that kind of dovetails into my question because I was looking at the financial statements. Um, it looks like there was a loss in 2022. Um, what what are some of the thoughts you guys are having around how to continue to grow that support? You know, uh, in, in from the community around around you know fundraising and or and or in kind donations uh, around needed food supplies. So the loss in 2022, good news is, is it was just investment income. Okay. So it was just our uh, investment portfolio assets. That's the good news. Um, we did finish the year in the positive as far as, you know, the books. Um, so that's the really good news. Income donations are tricky. We, we you know, 515 meals a day is very complicated. Um and especially because we publish the menu in a, a month in advance, again, so folks can kind of plan for their dietary needs. We keep reaching out and working with people. There's more and more opportunity coming online all the time. Boulder County has a lot of programs to support um, local farmers. Um, and they are hopeful that someday they will be able to help us. We've had okay. a lot of good conversations, but it's just not there yet. We do sometimes get fresh produce donation um, in that kind of gap time after the farmer's market closes, um, but the weather is still nice and that's always wonderful. And we can often make swaps uh, quickly in fresh produce. We are able to take donations when it comes to just kind of the smaller amounts we use in our salad bar. That's great. We've had some good luck there. We um, most closely work with the round pantry. They're on our list when they kind of get big, um, bulk items and we'll often put those things on our salad bar and then we do um do side salads for our clients uh wednesday fresh side salads wednesday through friday as well and so you know usually we have enough to go around for that as well um yes yeah, sometimes if we get enough donation of just kind of something in bulk like a cucumber 
we'll often send those home as well. Those are great, but they can't, it, it can't be something that is kind of the meat, the meat of what we do. Uh, it's just, it's too inconsistent. And because we are a professional kitchen, we're a commercial kitchen first, Boulder County um, Board of Health doesn't think of us as a nonprofit that way. They think of us as a professional restaurant. And so the rules are pretty strict. I mean, we can't even have anything that comes through the door that doesn't make kind of restaurant quality standards. So that makes things tricky. Um, but yes, um, we did struggle in 2022. We had to put out some rally cries of, hey, if donations are lagging. Uh, the good news is when we put out those rally cries, we did hear back from people. And so while we weren't able to cover our investment losses, we were able to kind of stay ahead nonetheless. Okay, thank you. Uh, any last questions? Our time is almost up. If not, I will give you your five minutes. Oh, man, I don't know. Uh, let me see. Oh, the other fun thing. I think I said this in the grant application as well, though. The other fun thing we did. So because more than half of our clients either are on low sodium or low sugar diets, that's why we start there. Because right off the bat, we're helping the majority of older folks and people with disabilities with their nutrition needs. But again, we kept getting feedback that it wasn't fun enough. And so uh, two to three times per month, we celebrate a national dessert day, like National Blueberry, you know, Muffin Day and things like that. And it has been really heartwarming. It's very sweet. The reaction has been just so lovely. There was the, the Blueberry Muffin Day. We ran out of blueberry muffins and we had to give some people some leftover Girl Scout cookies. And we got a call. He was, I was really looking forward to that blueberry muffin, but I'm glad I got Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> so, so that was another kind of fun thing we did um, this year. But yeah, it's just really kind of our numbers all of a sudden. We've really worked hard. There still is a lack of outreach events for older adults. And so we've really had to think outside the box. Um, as far as reading, reaching older adults. And um, it was our program manager who came up with the idea of doing the specials in the lunchroom to see if that would work just for word of mouth. And we never had to advertise it. We were afraid to advertise it to see what that, you know, in case that would be too much too soon with our expenses. We never had to advertise it. It really just spread word of mouth. And then we also saw increased home delivery as folks could then share with people, you know, their friends that were homebound. And so it was really outside the box. Like I said, it, it you know, for, for most of our clients, it really didn't make that big of an impact financially, but I think it, it, it just gave them resolve that, you know, there was something here for them and something here that was fun for them. Um, and they were able to spread the word. So that has been really exciting, but yes, now we are looking at numbers that we haven't seen since, in the spring of, of 2020 um, or all of 2019 was an exceptional year as well, but we're here for it. And, and we really do still want to see a community lunch at the same level as it was pre-pandemic. We're close, but we're still not quite there. And we want to see folks coming back into the senior center and staying for lunch. And we're still committed to seeing that come back as well. And we're going to continue to make it fun in there and um, make it special and make it a place where they can hang out with their friends. Um, and we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep outreaching, we'll keep doing the work to find everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much for all that Longmont Meals on Wheels does and what you do for the, for the community. I really appreciate it and appreciate your time. Thank you, I, I appreciate your time. I know that this um, volunteer job has way more hours in it than most city volunteer positions. So wow to you guys. <laughs> yes, you. these hearings are the biggest part of the volunteer job. Yes. So. Yes, thank uh, you all. Good night. All right. night, thank you. Well, thank you, you've made it through uh, another, another hearing. We have one more tomorrow. I'm not sure which of you or any of you are gonna be tomorrow with me. Uh,